So how did we get here? Well, if you've been following along in the Ethical Hacking series, hopefully you started off with, first of all, an understanding of ethical hacking. That particular course takes you through the environment, setting it up for yourself, understanding what ethical hacking means, because it, it is kind of misleading. A lot of people think hacking is bad, but it's not necessarily bad. In fact, I'm in the process of trying to hack my daughter's phone, happens to be a Samsung S4, because Verizon has locked it down more so than my Samsung phone on T-Mobile. They've actually taken away a feature, so I'm going to figure out how to open that up. We then went through and took a look at reconnaissance and footprinting. In that course, we took you through the process of coming up with a target, finding out its IP address range, looking at its DNS namespace, as well as other public data that could to help us focus in on our target itself. Now, then we went through in the scanning course and we talked about how to scan the network. How do we find the individual targets of our target? Target being the company, the targets would be the actual machines that support that company. We also looked at how we could discover services that were running or ports that were opened up. We also took a look at how to identify operating systems running on these different targets. Once we did that, the next course took us through the process of enumeration. Uh, GTL, that's a big word. Okay, well, enumeration is very easy to understand. All we're talking about with enumeration is using services as well as the OS to help us identify lists of user accounts on that machine, any security flaws, resources that may be available. Now, if you don't feel comfortable with these three components, trust me, you need to go back and watch these courses because this course is based off the fact that you have a firm background in these three subjects. I'm not going to have time to explain, okay, now we've enumerated, remember enumeration, I don't have time to do that because there is, ooh, yes, another course, another chance to say my word. There is a plethora of information when it comes to system hacking. So what are our goals in this course? Well, I'm going to take you down three different goals. The first goal is we need to try to gain access to the target. We've identified it. We understand what services are available, what ports are open. We understand the user accounts that may be on this machine, as well as possibly some vulnerabilities. After we gain access, we then want to go through and make sure that we can maintain access. Nothing's worse than getting into a machine only to be kicked out later because someone has made it more difficult for us to get in a second time. And part of maintaining access brings us to our third goal, which is covering your tracks. So I love watching documentaries, especially when it comes to like nature and animals. And I've always found it interesting. Uh, I had a dog and I found out that the reason why dogs do this particular mm, disgusting thing is because of their genetic background when it comes to being related to wolves. And that is, they will actually eat their feces. And the reason why they do that is they're trying to cover their tracks so that other predators or prey can't tell that they're in the area. Now, I'm not telling you to go do anything like that. But what we want to do is cover our tracks because if we don't, people see that we're into the system, what are they going to do? They're going to re-image the system or they're going to take it offline and fix all the problems that we've created and restrict our access. So covering your tracks is part of maintaining that access. But these are our three main goals. So let's see about digging into those three goals by looking at them in detail and also discovering what we refer to as the five phases. Now don't worry, I'll let you do the laugh, but you're going to wait for my cue, okay? So let's talk about the three goals and the five phases within those three goals that we're trying to accomplish during the system hacking stage. So the first goal is trying to gain access to the system. Again, we've identified the system. We understand what services are running. We possibly also know user account information. So the next step, we need two pieces of information when trying to gain access to the machine. We need a username, which we've talked previously how we accomplish that. But the next thing is we've got to crack the password. That's the next piece of information, right? We need not only the username, but we actually need to have a password. Now we have several different methods that we can use for cracking passwords, and we'll talk about those in an upcoming module. 
After we crack a password, our next phase is escalating the privileges. Now, we can either escalate the privilege of an account that we create, or we can take, and this is my favorite thing to do, take an account that already exists, like, you know, Billy Bob in the mailroom, and give him administrative rights. Because guess what? If I do get discovered, Billy Bob's going to get in trouble. Now, we don't have to pick on a particular user account. We can actually use service accounts that are already active. Again, we've got a whole module coming up just on doing this process. After we've gained access, we said that the second goal is then to maintaining access. Well, how do you do that, Dale? Well, you just leave your computer on 24-7. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through and launch applications or our tools. We have a tool set of the things that we like to work with the most. And I've got my own particular ones that I enjoy. You may come up with your own as well. But I'm going to launch those applications so that I can continue my attack from the inside. Or, again, maybe I've hit the initial target. Or maybe if this is my intended target or my final target, I need to launch my application so that I can get back in more easily. Now, the other thing I'm going to want to do, though, is I don't want people to see my tools on the system. So we're going to take you through, and the other phase is hiding your tools so that somebody browses around. They don't see a particular application installed on your machine. We need to hide that information. And we have several different ways that we can hide our tools. We've got root kits. We've got steganography. We've got the ability to, well, when it comes to steganography, holy cow, we can hide tools inside of mp3 files or inside of a movie file or inside of a driver. So now that we've maintained access, our next step will be then to cover our tracks. And how do we do that? Well, what is it on a machine that is typically tracking everything that we do on a system? I sometimes refer to it as Big Brother. Yeah, it's the log files, right? So this is actually where we go through and separate the good hackers from the great hackers. And I'll tell you the difference between those when we get to this module. But basically what we're going to do is either delete log files or we're going to modify them. What's cracking? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> when we talk about what is cracking, what we're meaning by this is going through and looking or discovering passwords that are either stored on a machine locally or we may try doing it during transmission. great example of this is, for example, FTP. Everybody FTP? Yeah, you know me. Now, FTP, you can tell I'm on one today, huh? <laughs> yeah. So when you log into an FTP server, your username and password, at least the default, is to transmit that in clear text. Well, obviously that's something that maybe I could pick up. So usually people ask me, Dale, is there really a good reason for Kraken? Yeah, there is. A lot of times people forget their passwords, especially when it comes to like standalone machines. Now, I would never recommend going through and trying to crack someone's password if you're in a domain environment, because that's the purpose of the feature of being able to reset a password. But many times I've get neighbors that come over and say, hey, Dale, I forgot my password on my machine or something's happened where I can't get in. Of course, I usually have a lot of red flags go up in my brain when they say all of a sudden I can't get in. But again, we can go through and reset local account passwords. Or maybe somebody has done something very malicious on our domain environment where they've locked out everyone's passwords as they you know left the building some disgruntled IT guy so there are some good purposes for cracking in fact if you do a little YouTube and there's several different sessions that you can watch from a convention called DEFCON where they talk about there's actually a gentleman in uh, I think it's the University of Florida they have a division of students that just go through and look at passwords that have been released they don't go and try to get to the passwords themselves but they go through and grab ones that people have posted because an attacker may have actually gone out and released it to the general public and they'll take those hashes and crack them and what it does for them is they don't actually go to verify it because they get funding from the government as well as several corporate 500 companies to do this type of research but what they do is they're able to go through and say hey these are the type of passwords that people are using which shows patterns now when it comes to Kraken we also have two different ways that we can do it we can automate it using some interesting tools which we'll show you throughout this module I know you want to laugh don't you you're rubbing your hands 
get ready because I'm going to let you go. <laughs> or we can do this manually. And you may be thinking, manually? How do you do a manual crack? Well, trust me, we'll talk about that. Well, here's the problem that we have when it comes to cracking and passwords. And I'm going to sum it up real easy. It's this. Most users are going to pick something that they know when it comes to creating a password because they have to remember it, right? Well, that's what leads to the flaw of how easy it is to crack people's passwords. Most people will go through and in their password use a name of a family member, they'll use the name of a pet, their favorite, one of the more popular ones is a sports team. Uh, schools, whether it be college, elementary, high school, comic book hero, oh, I gotta change some passwords. No, um, but things that they can remember. That's the reason why passwords are easily hacked in many cases, because in order to remember the password, it has to mean something to the user. They will also use things like swear words. Yeah, believe it or not. Uh, locations, like their favorite place to go or cities that they lived in. Religious names are also a very big one. So once they start off with these types of words, then they think they're being tricky and they add numbers to either the ending or the beginning of that password. And those numbers also have to mean something to them. So typically we find that people use their birth year, a graduation year, maybe their anniversary year. I don't use that one because I don't remember when I got married. Uh-oh, don't tell my wife I just said that. Now again, before you start trying to socially engineer me, none of my passwords deal with any of these options. Which kind of brings around the next subject, and that is we require people to create difficult passwords, but it's got to be somewhat easy to remember. Otherwise, we get help tickets being opened all day long. Uh, I locked up myself out. Uh, Dale, I don't remember my password. So, in my book, as far as a proper password policy is concerned, we typically rely on three different options. And that is one, something you are, like biometrics, a thumbprint, retinal scan. Yeah, I know how many of your laptops out there have retinal scans, right? Okay, maybe some of them, but not everybody. In fact, that's one of the exciting things about Windows 10 is that Microsoft is building into it biometrics, and it's not biometrics that can be tricked very easily. If your laptop or tablet has a camera on it, it actually can use your face to log you in. And don't worry, they've done it with a three-dimensional aspect. It's something that they learned from, got to give props to Xbox. Remember the Kinect? Well, the Kinect does a three-dimensional recognition of your face and obviously sometimes your body, which is really scary if it's looking at my body. But uh, what they've learned is that they've created the technology that if you hold up a picture of my face in front of the camera, it sees it as a flat structure and it realizes there no, there's no depth. Yeah, I know. Insert your own joke on that one, right? <laughs> but there's no depth to the picture. Uh, the demo they actually show you is the gentleman holds a picture of himself up in front of his face and the laptop doesn't log him in. He removes the picture so his face is exposed and the laptop immediately logs him in. So that's kind of cool because it's not like somebody can steal your biometrics. Well, unless they're cutting your finger off. and That's a whole other issue. There's also something you have, which is another option, which would be something like we call them cat cards. You know, like how you have to swipe a card. Uh, I've been on several military bases where they have these cards that you place inside the keyboard. It's kind of cool. It looks like a credit card type swipe device, but it just holds the card and they put it right in there and that logs them in. But again, you have a problem with cat cards or with something you have because somebody can steal that. And that's why we also like to think about or utilize something you know, which would be a password. Now, I'm a big fan also of multi-factor authentication that's starting to take place. We're seeing this almost everywhere, especially online, where not only do you have to type in a password, but then we're going to send a text message to your cell phone that you've registered or to an email address that you've already registered and have you verify with a code that the company has sent to you. And to be honest with you, as of late, because of the number of passwords that are getting cracked, I really think we're going to see a huge change. And again, my personal opinion is we're probably leaning towards biometrics. Complexity. Now, complexity means that we create these passwords. We need to kind of make them a little bit more difficult for an attacker to guess. 
Now, how we handle this is we typically use, at least in Microsoft's case, their requirement for complexity is that you have to use three of the following four options. And there are good options as far as a rule of thumb is concerned. The first option is obviously using uppercase characters in your password. Now, I wouldn't necessarily make all my characters uppercase. The computer might think I'm yelling at it. We also can use lowercase characters, and you can use those in any order. You don't have to start off with an uppercase, then end with lowercases, or vice versa. We also can inject, with complexity, numbers. So at this point, we have what they refer to as an alphanumeric-based password. But I'll be honest with you guys. If this is the only three that you're using for your complexity, someone's going to pwn you eventually here. That's why we like special characters. Now, again, we have to be careful with these special characters because there's some assumptions and users make that attackers make as well. We'll talk about that here in just a second. One of my favorite special characters, though, that just drives attackers crazy is the space bar. But any special characters will help you in creating complexity. Now, just because it's complex doesn't mean that you're safe. Because you have to be careful. First of all, you have to be careful what we refer to as the Fab Five. And that's the characters the at sign, the dollar sign, the three, the zero, and the explanation point, which a lot of people try to, ooh, trick me, because I'll never guess that the dollar sign is representing S's or the zero's representing an O. Yeah, yeah. Trust me, I've got dictionaries and mechanisms that will help me to assume that. Remember I told you there's this assumption that's being made? So be careful with the Fab Five. Don't think that, Something like this, open me up. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to guess that the three is an E. And so help me, if you do something like this, I will hurt you. Let me in, really? Oh, my other favorite is open sesame. Yeah. You don't think that's on a dictionary? And I know, even though this is a really cool password, at least in my book, it's not going to fool anybody. Now, the reason why I always use that password up at the top here, this is the default password for all Microsoft labs in uh, the training environment. And the reason why we use it is because Microsoft requires that three of the four complexity requirements are fulfilled, and this one does fulfill it. But again, folks, complexity isn't everything. Uh, what do you mean by that, Dale? Well, let me show you. Okay, so this is a tool that you can download. It's called the Password Recovery Time Simulator. It's a great proof of concept that I use all the time to show people how easy it is to brute force attack a password. Now, I told you complexity isn't everything. It's in the length. Now, first of all, do me a favor. I will include this program in the files download section of this courseware. I don't want you going to or getting tricked into going to a website and again, oh man, I'm going to hurt you. You do not go to a website that says type in your password. We'll tell you how secure it is because guess what? Eh, it's not secure anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how long it takes to brute force attack a password. Now, first of all, we never, ever, ever use real words because they're what we refer to as dictionaries out there. And we'll talk about those here in just a second. But basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It contains a bunch of words and Oh, man, I got tons of dictionaries for different subjects. But as an example, let's see, you know that I like Batman, so we'll put in here, Batman rules. Okay, if I try to do this, if I try to brute force attack this, it is only going to take about five minutes to crack this password in a brute force attack because it's real words. In fact, if I wasn't that long, if it was just Batman, guess what? Yeah, it's instantaneous because that's going to be in a dictionary somewhere. Same thing with, let's see, my last name, Meredith. Yeah, it's instant. So when I try to teach end users, and I, again, I do a lot of community-based talks and, and seminars where I try to get across, because this is such a pet peeve for me, how to create complex passwords but still make them easy to remember for the end user. And let's face it, sometimes you're the end user. Well, this is how I do it. Let's use a syntax that we use daily now. Uh, what do you mean by that, Dale? Let me show you. You see, I'm using a DNS naming syntax. But because of the length and the special characters of the periods, guess what? 
this password takes a little bit longer to brute force attack. And hopefully, my policy has me change my password before this many years goes by, right? <laughs> so it doesn't necessarily have to follow an actual DNS syntax. In fact, I don't know, maybe I'll do M's because it's upside down W. Or maybe I'll throw in a capital in there. MMM dot I love craftsman tools dot com or dot whatever. I don't care. It doesn't have to be a real website again. It can be anything you want. I love, matter of fact, let's do I love craftsman dot tools. This one is extremely long, and I think we have to go through the time space continuum or at least get our DeLorean up to 88 miles an hour <laughs> to go forward in time before this one's going to get cracked, at least through brute force. Now, just to prove the point here, again, it's all in the length. And I'll show you. Watch. If I just do the dark, that's going to be relatively fast because it's a real word. But I'm going to start adding some characters. K-N-I. Let's see what I'm at. That's three characters. There we go. We're up to 11 seconds. We'll add a G. Uh-oh, five minutes. H. Two hours. T. Two days. Watch what happens on the dot. Those special characters are golden. In fact, let's add a space and go calm. So again, it's in the length, as well as the special characters. I mean, if I just back this up, so there is no, if I just leave the com in here, you'll notice it does take a while, but not as long as that special character. Now, again, I'm going to preference this. This is only based off of brute force attacking a password, meaning I'm going to try every possible combination. And again, to prove the point as far as it's in the length, if I go back here and do a three dark instead of an E, Again, it's not long enough. The special characters aren't long enough. Again, the length plus the special characters doesn't give me enough. Even if I do this, it's because the length is too short. And we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. So if I continue this, we'll do a capital K, I, or K, N. Calculate that one. There we go, 16 hours. Let's see, instead of an I, we'll do the number one. 62 day, 64 days. You see what's happening? The other issue that we have is that people use the same password over and over and over. Major mistake. Okay, so let's take a look at the architecture of how passwords are stored. Because we mentioned that we can try to hack a password either while it's in storage or while it's in transmission or what they refer to as in motion. So where are the passwords stored? Well, that really does depend on the operating system that you're using and the environment that you're in. For example, when it comes to Windows, if this is just a machine that is not part of a domain, maybe it's your home PC or it's grandma's PC or it's your laptop, there's actually a database on the hard drive that's referred to as the SAM database. Now, the SAM database is located wherever you've installed Windows. The default is Windows slash System32 slash config slash SAM. In fact, let's take a look at it here. Here I've opened up my file explorer, and I've gone to my C drive where I installed Windows under System32. There's a directory called config. If I expand that out, you'll notice inside of here there's this nifty little file called the SAM file. Now, the passwords themselves are actually stored in a hash, and this location or this database is actually mounted up as a registry entry, which you can see through hkeylocalmachine slash SAM. But that's getting kind of nerdy on you. Now, on a domain environment, user accounts are stored in a centralized database on a domain controller, or any domain controller for that matter. And we'll talk about that one a little bit later on. But normally, we see these being stored locally. In some older operating systems for Microsoft, there was actually a repair directory that it had a backup copy of the SAM file. Now, if you're in a domain environment, user accounts are not stored on the local drive of the client machine. 
user accounts are actually stored in a file that's called the ntds.dit file that's located on every single domain controller in your environment. And on your domain controllers, it's stored inside of a directory that's called Windows ntds.dit. In fact, let's show you. So here I am on the C drive of my domain controller. And inside of my Windows directory, I have a subdirectory that's called, it's top secret, don't tell anybody, NTDS, which is NT, or New Technology Directory Services. And inside of there, there's the famous NTDS.dit file. This is the database file that has all my accounts for my infrastructure, or it's the main database for Active Directory. Now, don't think Linux doesn't do the same thing, because guess what it does? It stores its passwords inside of the Etsy directory in a file that's called Shadow. Yeah, but yeah, you didn't say anything about Apple because it rules. No, no, trust me, it's still there. For Apple, we actually store it in a file that's called the user.plist, which is located in the var directory under db, dslocal, nods, default, and then users. And this file, this user and that's, that is inside of the greater than and less than brackets, .plist is or has a shadow hash data property associated to it. And there's ways that you can open this file up. Now, typically, again, like I said, you normally just can't grab these, right? You're thinking, I'll just go grab them. Well, guess what? Now, these files do contain your authentication credentials, but they're stored as hash values. So it's not like you can just open it up. In fact, most of the files are gonna be locked while the OS is running. Now, as far as it being hashed, you need to know that it's a one-way algorithm, which means I can't reverse the hash. Okay, good deal, that's cool. Then uh, obviously, you know, I'm secure. No, because I can steal it, folks. Okay, so here I am back on our virtual machines, and I'm gonna, I shut down uh, Windows 7 because I'm gonna use it as my guinea pig. I'm going to make some configuration changes. And again, these configuration changes will be different compared to whatever virtualization you're using. But I'm going to come into the settings. And a couple things I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to actually increase the RAM here a bit for this particular box. Um, just because I know what I'm about to do is going to be memory intensive. So I'm going to bump that up to 4 gigs. I'm also going to take my processor and I'm going to bump that up a couple as well. And then I'm going to mount an ISO which is a, uh, a virtual CD for a product that's called Lofcrack. Now, Lofcrack has been around for years. Uh, very, very easy to reset passwords with it. Uh, it. It'll do brute force attacks for you, as well as use something called Rainbow Tables, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But I'm just going to open this up for a second or mount that as an ISO. And then I'm also going to make sure that I boot from my CD because I don't want to boot into Windows 7. Because remember, again, I can't grab that file or do anything with that file while the operating system is running. So one of the ways that you could actually get that SAM database off is to boot off of a different CD or USB drive access the hard drive of the local machine and copy it over, and then you could take it and do whatever you want offline. So I'm going to go ahead and let's fire this bad boy up. We'll start this thing. And you'll notice here it starts off asking us about which mode do we want to go into. And I'm going to go ahead and go into automatic mode. Uh, this is, again, a live CD, which means you could burn this to a USB drive for exactly the purpose I just discussed that I could slap this into a machine and reboot it, boot right back into it, and gain access to the system. So you'll notice right away it already found my SAM file and it already took off the user accounts. Now, because this is kind of interesting, it's kind of a quirk, this particular distribution of Linux, which is what Offcrack utilizes, does not support the traditional Microsoft drivers for a mouse and a key, excuse me, for a mouse. It does support a keyboard. So you can see my mouse cursor down here in the middle of the screen, but I actually don't have control of it. So I'm gonna have to become the, the master of keyboards, sir. So I'm gonna do this. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load up what they refer to as a, as a table so that I can try to crack this. And I'm gonna use my tab key to go over to my tables. I'm gonna hit my space bar to open it up and you can see that they have several tables that you can download uh, or get gain access to. I'm going to just tab through here until I get to the install button and then I'm going to hit my space bar again 
and I'm going to browse to a directory on this computer now, which is actually the CD-ROM. I hit tab until I get my green arrow over here highlighted. There we go. Now I'm going to hit uh, spacebar to go up, spacebar to go up again. There we go. Now we're in the root of the hard drive, and the tables come with Lovecrack. And they are located, i got to tab here until I get into the directory side. And now I can use my down arrow. I'm going to go to my media and hit enter. And I'm going to come down here to my HDC and hit enter. And there it is right there. It's called tables. And they give us a free one. Now how Loftcrack makes a little money is that they make rainbow tables available for purchase. But I think if you did a little Googling, you might be able to find some rainbow tables. Again, we'll talk about rainbow tables here in an upcoming module. I just want you to see how easy it is to see the hash file based off of the SAM file. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tab over and highlight crack, and I'm going to hit the space bar, and it's going to start up the cracking process. I'm going to hit tab down a couple times here just to get down to this area here, and I'm going to expand that out so you can see this go on. So you can see here it's already gone through and found the password for Clark Kent, which, yeah, it was super. And I'd normally go through and, and let this continue to run, but time is of the essence. Trust me, by the time this is done, it will have discovered the passwords because they were smaller passwords. They, they were just the standard seven-character passwords. So what are the techniques used for Kraken? Well, there's several of them. First of all, You've heard me use the phrase a dictionary attack or that there's a dictionary out there. Dictionary attacks are definitely one of the most common ways that we can go after passwords, but we can also use brute force attacks. Another type of technique that we can use is going to be what they refer to as a syllable attack. And we'll talk about each one of these here in just a second. I just want to show you some of the different techniques, which also would include a hybrid attack. I bet you can, can't figure out what that's going to do. It's a hybrid of something, yeah. Um, and then, of course, we also have what they refer to as rule-based attacks. And this is going to reflect back on what we learned in previous courses. And then finally, there's always the good old reliable guessing. Now, guessing passwords require, again, something we've talked about in a previous course. We were looking at reconnaissance and footprinting is that we will try to figure out as much as we can about the target, whether it's a user or a company, because many times... As we mentioned before, users base passwords off of things that they know. So if I can go on social media, do you think I can figure out who their favorite sports team is or what their pet dog was growing up or their spouse's birth date? Again, we share way too much information. But let's start with the dictionary attacks. Dictionary attacks, exactly what they sound like. We're going to have files that we can go and download off of the Internet, as well as you can create your own if you want, I guess, that are just text documents of words. And when I say words in a dictionary attack, I mean I can find a dictionary based off different languages, whether it's English, French, German, Russian, Klingon. So do you understand what I'm saying when I say don't make a password based off of any real word? And your response should be, Giaj. Okay, my trekkiness just came out, didn't it? We also have dictionaries based off of subjects. Yep, I've got a dictionary out there that has medical terms in it. Historical accounts, historical places, uh, characters, characters not only in books, their names, but maybe something specific to the book itself, like a catchphrase. Characters would also include movie characters. I've got a dictionary that's just filled with names from J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. I've got a dictionary of famous people's names, movie stars, again, historical famous people locations, events. So don't think you're getting tricky just because you're using a password that may not be a traditional password because you're basing it off of a real word. Please, please, folks, don't do that. And don't think that for a second, I'll just put it in backwards. Well, any password cracking tool out there that's worth its weight in salt will do what they refer to as string manipulation, where it'll take the word and try it in different combinations or reversing it. So again, you're not tricking me. Now let's talk about brute force attacks. Listen to me now, hear me later, understand me next week. Brute force attacks do take longer. <laughs> okay, I can't do that all the way. Sorry, guys. Man, that's a good looking guy, isn't it? Huh? Huh? I think I've been hitting the roids. No, uh, brute force attacks, they do take longer to accomplish. 
And what we mean by a brute force attack is that we go through and we try every combination of alphanumeric and specialized characters in a password. Now, obviously, if the password is only six characters long, brute force attacks go by relatively quickly. But when we start to get into passwords beyond 14 characters, it gets a lot more difficult. So it does require more cycles to go through and, and try every variation. By the way, brute force attacks, it's so funny. Have you guys ever seen a movie where they're trying to crack a password and let's say it's five digits long or five characters long and you see it scanning and going through and all of a sudden like the third character click like locks in to the letter A and they're like, he's almost got the password. That's not how it works. That's not brute force. Brute force has to try every variation. Now there's an upshot to brute force attacks, even though it does take longer and it tries every combination, which takes more cycles. Guess what, folks? It's 100% effective. It's just time. And again, I go back and mention what we've talked about previously when it comes to time. Who has time? The attackers. We also have those syllable attacks. Now, with the syllable attack, what we do is we take a password. In this case here, we'll say the password is pass. And we go through and we do a combination of a dictionary and a brute force. And we try every possible arrangement of every entry in the dictionary. Now, obviously, I didn't have enough space to go through and do every option, but you get the idea here. You see I've moved the A in, then I move the S in on the next one, and I'm trying every possible combination. Another type of attack is the hybrid attack. A hybrid attack still uses a dictionary, but based on users being complacent, we're going to try different variations by including numbers and special characters either at the beginning or at the end of the password. So let's say I have Batman. And next month I have to change my password, so I change it to Batman 1. And next month I change it to Batman 2. Well, a hybrid attack is going to go through and eventually crack this one. And by the way, if you're just modifying or your users are modifying their passwords each month just by adding a character or two to the very end of it, smack yourself upside the forehead and promise you'll never do that again. Now, don't go smack your users' foreheads. You might get called in by HR. We also have rule-based attacks. What do you mean by rule-based, Dale? Well, remember enumeration? If you're not familiar with it, you need to go back and watch that course. But with enumeration, we can go through and use the rules that we've discovered, like we require users to have at least an eight-character password. I'm going to use those against you. And knowing that you use complexity, I'm able to discover possibly that you require two digits. So I use a combination of a brute force, a dictionary, and a syllable attack. Again, if I know that you only have eight characters, it's all you require for your passwords, I'm not going to try nine or ten characters. Or if you don't require a digit, then why run through those digits? Okay, so now that we know the different techniques used to do some cracking, let's talk about the types of attacks. Now, these are typically summed up in about four different categories. The first one being a passive online attack. Now, these type of attacks, again, they're passive, which means we're not going to have a direct communication necessarily with the machine or with the target. Passive online attacks include things like sniffing the network to see if we can discover passwords going back and forth. Great example of this is FTP. FTP uses clear text by default, and so just sitting there sniffing, we might be able to pick up some passwords, as well as man-in-the-middle attacks. This type of an attack occurs when an attacker places his machine or his hacking device between the source and the destination, and he just handles all the traffic going back and forth. And again, I'm not modifying anything. It's very passive. Hardly anyone can tell that I'm doing anything. I'm just capturing the data, making sure it all passes through me before maybe it goes to a switch. We'll show you a tool coming up here in a minute where we'll do a man-in-the-middle attack. And then we also have sidejacking. Now, sidejacking was actually made famous by a Firefox plugin that was called FireSheep, which basically allowed an attacker to go to any Wi-Fi access point, like at a Starbucks or some coffee shop or internet cafe. And if he was on the same Wi-Fi access point as other users, he could actually steal their cookies in the middle of their transaction and do things like, oh, you know, log on to their Facebook, take over their Facebook session. So again, these are these are relatively passive. I'm not attacking a specific target. Now there's active online. 
Now, active online is exactly that. It's a lot more active. We know the more active we are, the more chances we have technically to be caught. These type of attacks include things like a hash injection. This is where we actually inject a compromised hash into a current session and then use the hash to authenticate to the network resources. We could also use a Trojan or a keylogger. We're going to talk about those more in detail coming up. In fact, we have a whole course coming up just on Trojans themselves. But when it comes to things like keyloggers, this is where we're going to monitor every single keystroke going on a particular system or a particular target. And all those keystrokes, depending on the keylogger itself, could be transmitted back to the attacker. We also could use, again, guessing. Guessing is extremely noisy. It's easy to detect because usually accounts get locked out. Except for, hmm, let's see, which account never gets locked out? Hmm. We also have offline attacks. These are the really interesting ones because with offline attacks, we have all the time in the world. What we mean by offline is I'm somehow able to get a hold of wherever, whatever storing your passwords and user accounts and I get to play with it offline. I'm not going to hit that machine. I, I grab the database, like the SAM account database, or maybe I've grabbed your ntds.dit file, and I can start throwing things like a rainbow attack, as well as a distributed network attack, also known as a DNA, where I'm going to use multiple machines to help me try to crack your passwords. We can also try utilizing pre-computed hashes. Now what happens here is that an attacker can decrypt each word in a dictionary using a hash function and then compare it to the encrypted password. Now the downside to this is that it does require a lot of space, but the payoff is that it's extremely fast. The other type of attack would be non-electronic. Now some of these we've already talked about back in our reconnaissance course. We talked about dumpster diving. This is where we look through trash. Now that may be seen below a lot of you, but trust me, this goes on. I think I mentioned in the reconnaissance course that Oracle caught Microsoft in, shall we say, fibs? Because they had done some dumpster diving in the Microsoft trash bins. Shoulder surfing is another type of attack. This is where somebody is obviously watching over your shoulder or using some type of mechanism. The uh, latest and greatest now is, let's see, I've got an electronic cell phone in my hand that does video. How about if I hold that up to my ear like I'm talking to somebody? but I point my camera to where you're typing in a password. Hmm, things that make you go hum. In fact, I'm really paranoid about that kind of stuff. When I'm out shopping, if I'm going to run my credit card somewhere, I always stop and look around and see if somebody's pretending to be on their cell phone and it just happens to be pointing my way. And of course, social engineering, which we also talked about in the reconnaissance course. Now there's another thing we can do with social engineering that kind of is a non-electronic attack, but it's kind of borderline. Very, very famous attack. And that is using what we refer to as a USB switchblade. You're like, what? There's a fight? Now what this is, is this is a USB drive that I've gone through and I've configured so that when you plug it in, it goes through and does some really interesting things. Like maybe install a keylogger for me, maybe a piece of malware. And it does it all silently, maybe even then emails me your login credentials that I detected. And what I do is I take that USB drive and I just arbitrarily leave it someplace where I know somebody will find it. Like, for example, in a parking lot of a, of a company or in the main lobby or in a hallway near a bathroom, someplace near the target company. Somebody picks that up. What's the first thing they're going to try to do? Yeah, they're going to plug in this bad boy, and bing, they just got pwned. The hash. Getting my hash brown on. Smoking my ha Ooh, wait a minute. Nope, wrong hash. So when we're talking about hash, we're typically talking about how the passwords are actually stored on the systems. Now, obviously, if I had a file that stored usernames and passwords and it was completely clear text, there would be no use for having security, right? Because anybody could find that file. You remember that SAM database? Well, it stores user accounts and passwords in what they refer to as a hashed format. Now, back in the day, Microsoft used something called LMHash, which, oh man, what a nightmare. And 
sometimes still today it is a nightmare. And I get this all the time whenever we teach ethical hacking. It's like, why do you talk about passwords and all this stuff with older OSs? Why not be talking about the new stuff? Well, I'll be honest with you. It's almost like a hunter. If I'm going to go out and hunt my prey, I'm not going to go out after the latest, newest target out there. I want to go after the oldest. It's slower. No one's paying attention to it. Who knows if it's been updated? The newer stuff has newer technologies and sometimes makes it harder for me. And trust me, I, I just taught a class two weeks ago. And in the class were two IT guys from a huge state organization. And as we were talking, they told me, yep, they still have some XP machines and some Server 2000 and 2003 systems. Now, you may be shaking your head, but again, why would I upgrade a machine that does one task? In their case, it handled their imaging system for documentation. We see this all the time also like in um, manufacturing facilities where they, there's a robotic arm that just goes back and forth all day long, and it's being controlled by a Windows machine. Does it need to have Windows 10 on it? It works fine with XP. So what would happen is that if you created a password that was 14 characters or less, we would actually take that password. We'll say it was Batman rules because obviously that should be a password that everybody uses. No, what would happen is LMHash would then go through and take all the letters. Didn't matter if you had upper and lower case, but it converted it to all uppercase. After it converted it to all uppercase, it then padded any leftover fields so that it filled out all 14 characters. So in this case here, I'd have three padded spaces. Then things got kind of crazy. LMHash then went through and split up the password into two seven character strings. The two seven character strings were then encrypted and then combined back together. So as an example, Batman R would be hashed out to this value and the leftover ools with its padded spaces would be encrypted to this hash. Then they were combined together, and that would be your LM hash. Microsoft then added NTLM, which is the NT LAN manager hash. So the result that we would see inside of the SAM account database included the user's name, in this case here, B. Wayne, a number listed after his name, and we'll talk about that one here in just a second followed by the next 32 characters, which was the LM hash, and then they appended an NTLM hash. Now, the big difference between these two was in the password hash algorithm. LM used what they referred to as DES, which was very easy to crack. Then they came out with NTLM version 1, which got us to using MD4, which was a better algorithm, but NTLM version 2 used MD5, which is even better and technically you should use it whenever possible. So then you might see another account listed in there as administrator followed by 500. That number, remember I told you we'd talk about that number? Anybody remember from enumeration what that number represented, especially on an administrator account? 500. Yeah, that's the SID. All administrative accounts in the Microsoft world ends with a 500 at the end of the SID. And again, I would see a combination of the LM hash and the NTLM hash. Here's another one. Gee, I, I wonder what the password is. <laughs> okay, now some notes here for you. Anytime you see a hash that ends with a double A, D3, B4, 35, B5, 1404, double E, this should mean something to you. And you're like, Dale, I'm not a dork. No, um, this is a very, very common ending hash. And what it means to you is this, is that the last seven characters, remember we have to pad it to make sure we equal 14 characters? This tells me that the a password is seven or less characters in length. Now, something similar happens if somebody types in a password that's over 14 characters. Remember we told you this is what all happens with 14 characters. Well, if it's over 14 characters, then the LM hash value is dumbed. It's not even utilized. In fact, that's how we used to teach people to bypass the LM hash environment, is that you had to create a password over 14 characters. Operating systems today, since Vista and higher, have the LM hash turned off. So you might see this one quite a bit.
Now, we just talked about NTLM and the LM hash. Let's talk about now about NTLM authentication. Now, this authentication mechanism is very proprietary to Microsoft, and it's the default authentication that is used if some specific situations exist. I know some of you guys are going, Dale, it's Kerberos. They're using Kerberos. I know that, except if the following situations apply to you. So it is only used when there are no Kerberos trusts between two different forests and you're trying to share resources. I know you're thinking Dale learned some new tricks in PowerPoint, huh? Huh? Look very closely at the spinning wheel and email Dale your password credit card information, and social security number. <laughs> um, another time that NTLM gets utilized instead of Kerberos is if authentication is being attempted by an IP instead of by DNS name, because Kerberos requires DNS or a domain name environment. Also, if one or both of the systems are not a part of the same domain. So don't think that you're not using NTLM, because you very well could be. And the other situation is if you by chance have a firewall that's blocking Kerberos. Wheels on the bus go around. Okay, I'm not going to get that song stuck in your heads. Okay, Dale, so now we know when it's used, but how is it used? Well, it's based off of a challenge response algorithm. Now, whenever I talk about challenge responses, I'm reminded of a movie that uh, I grew up with. And in fact, I'm going to give you guys a homework assignment. You can tell your boss or your significant other that you've been assigned the task for ethical hacking to go watch a movie called Mighty Python and the Holy Grail. And I have some caveats here for you, but you got to make sure that you only watch it late at night when you're feeling a little punchy. In it, there's a scene where the bridge keeper is guarding this bridge. In order to get across, you had to answer three questions. And the first question was, what is your name? And Sir Lancelot says, Sir Lancelot. And then he says, what is your quest? And, he, and Sir Lancelot says, my quest is for the Holy Grail. And then he says, what's your favorite color? Blue. And he says, okay, you can pass. The next knight shows up and he says, what is your name? And he says, my name is Sir Robin of Camelot. He says, what is your quest? My quest is for the Holy Grail. He then says, what is the capital of Assyria? <laughs> and Robin goes, I don't know. What? And he gets ejected off the cliff. It's pretty funny. You have to watch it. But that's a typical challenge. And what is the response? If you are who you say you are, then you should be able to answer these questions. In fact, when King Arthur answers, one of the knights says, I didn't know you knew so much about swallows. And he said, well, you have to know those things when you're the king. So again, that's how we verify. Now, the cool thing about this is that passwords are never transmitted because you're just going to respond to a request or to a challenge. As I mentioned before, NTLM came in version one back in Windows NT, and, and trust me, just say no. And I can't even imagine even an NT box out there still that would be running version one. Because when they released Service Pack 4, version two was released, and it was a lot more secure for us. So again, don't think that you're not using it, because you very well could be. Well, let's take a look at how it actually operates. So this is how it works. You've got your client machine. A user sits down, throws the three finger salute and gets their login screen. They type in their username and password. Now Windows takes that password and runs it through a hash algorithm to generate a hash for the password that's been entered. The client then sends a login request to the domain controller and since the computer has joined the domain, the domain controller is very much aware of the hash value associated to that login name. So the domain controller then creates a random string and sends it and says, basically, if you are who you say you are, you should be able to answer this request. The client encrypts this request with the hash and sends it back to the domain controller. The domain controller then goes through again retrieves the password or the hash of the user's password and compares it to see if it's the correct answer. If it's the same answer, then you're allowed to cross the bridge. If it's wrong, what? You do not get to pass. Another type of authentication that we can use is called Kerberos authentication. And this is what we're using pretty much up to date. 
with the latest and greatest from Microsoft. Now, Kerberos gets its name from the three-headed dog that guards the gates of hell, or also Fluffy if you're a Harry Potter fan. Kerberos is better, stronger, and faster. It is ticket-based, so we issue tickets that are then used to represent the credentials. It's, again, fast because we don't have to keep re-authenticating the user over and over, or possibly the computer. And again, it avoids the transmission of passwords. Now, there is one little kicker on this one, and that is that it's time-based. Everybody remember the PDC back with enumeration? The PDC was in charge of syncing everybody's clock to itself. Because when it comes to Kerberos, the default with Microsoft is you cannot be more than five minutes in time difference between the PDC and your system clock. If you are, we won't authenticate you. So let's take a look at how Fluffy is used. First of all, we have a computer and a user, and we know that we have a domain controller. Now the domain controllers have some special services running on them. One of them is what they refer to as the KDC, or a key distribution center. And let's say that we have a file server that we're trying to gain access to. Well, again, the user is going to make a request to the domain controller saying, I need to be authenticated, please. The domain controller responds back with a, yeah, what can I do for you? I can authenticate you. The user's computer then says, I need to get a TGT. This is short for a ticket granting ticket. Think of it as a hall pass. Remember those days in school when you had to go to the restroom, you had to get a hall pass because if you got caught out in the hallway without a pass, you got in trouble. Same concept here. Again, because the computer and the domain controller are members of the same domain, the domain controller is able to issue this TGT or this ticket to the user to be then utilized when they want to gain access to resources. I believe the default timeout on a TGT is like eight hours. So you have to re-authenticate regardless every eight hours. So when the user wants to gain access to the file on the, on the file server, they just simply present their TGT. The file server sees that it's from a trusted source. It will quickly check with the domain controller and say, is this account still valid? And the reason why it does this in case an administrator has locked the user out. But again, no passwords are ever transmitted throughout the environment. Now, just because tickets are being utilized here doesn't mean that you're safe. We'll be looking at a tool a little bit later on called John the Ripper. Very, very famous tool. It's probably one of the more powerful tools out there today. And John the Ripper, it's a Linux tool. It can crack Unix, LM hash passwords, NTLM passwords, and Kerberos passwords. Salting. Yeah, my hash needs a little salt. So the issue that we have here is that if I have two users with the exact same password, what is their hash going to look like? Yeah, it's going to be identical. Well, what we can do is we can randomize the hashes by appending or prepending random strings, we call it a salt, to the password before we hash. Now, this again helps us with having duplicate hashes as well as it makes it really hard for an attacker to find out what's going on. Now, each salt needs to make sure that it's unique for each password. Don't use the same string of characters for every password. Then all I have to do is figure out what your salting string is, and I'm going to get everybody's password. Let's say, for example, that I've got two accounts that are both using the same password. Again, the hash values will be identical. If I use salt, I can append some unique characters to the end of the password. Therefore, two different accounts using the same password have different hash values. To check if the password is correct, we have to be able to have access to the salt. So it's usually stored in a user account database along with the hash or as part of the hash string itself. Now, I'm going to give an unfortunate shout out here because Microsoft won't use this. Well, they kind of use it in the aspect that the passwords in Active Directory are hashed, but the ending hash is just the user name itself. So again, make sure that if you're going to salt your passwords, that each salt is unique to each password. So if you're a developer and you're creating your application and you want to make it so people have to log in, common mistake is that they'll hard code in a salt into the program 
or they generate the salt only once and then reuse it. Because again, if I'm using the same salt for every password, two users with the same password are going to have the same hash. There's also the issue of your salt not being long enough. Say, for example, three characters. Well, three characters really narrow down the limits of the number of possibilities the attacker needs to consider. Now, because I just told you that the hash needs to be available, that kind of creates a dilemma, right? Because if the key is kept on the system and the attacker gains full access to the system, they'll be able to steal the key no matter how long the salt is. So the key needs to be stored in external systems, such as a physically separated server dedicated for password validation. Or there's even some specialized hardware out there that can help store your salt keys. Now if we can only add some pepper. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Yeah, okay. Rainbow tables. And some other options for Kraken. Now, I know what you're thinking. When we talk about a rainbow table, I'm not talking about a piece of furniture designed by Google. A rainbow table is pre-computed hash tables, so I don't have to try every variation of the hash values. I pre-computed them ahead of time. I just have to do comparisons. Now, unfortunately, they take up a lot of space to go through all the different variations. It's not uncommon to see rainbow tables become quite large. In fact, here, let me show you real fast. These are free rainbow tables that you can download. Here's some from MD5 based. And this is alpha spaced. They've also got lower alpha, 1 through 10. So this first one is alphanumeric with spaces, uh, 1 to 9 passwords. And you can see 24 gigs. If I scroll down here, here's some NTLM rainbow tables. They get really big. Now you can also go through and create your own rainbow tables if you've got the storage to handle it. And what's kind of interesting is that with new technology like solid state drives and cloud computing, attackers are actually utilizing these technologies to create rainbow tables at record speeds and utilizing processing power of mm, Amazon's cloud system or Azure. After they compile them, a lot of guys will then go off and sell them. As you might recall, that's how Offcrack makes money, is that they sell their rainbow tables. Now, there's another type of table out there that we can utilize. They're just called lookup tables. Just a plain old table. And what it does is it basically says, does any hash out there equal this particular hash? It's just a table of hashes. Oh, well, look, I found one, and it, the password was called password5, because that's what the hash equaled. Well, it continues to go through those tables, maybe saying, hey, what about this one? Oh, not in the database, so nobody's got that password or that hash. Your Kraken tool will go through and continue. Hey, can I get a let me in 12? Any responses? Yes. Well, here's another one. Try this one. This particular hash equals McDonald's, spelt a little differently. And it'll continue depending on the size of the table that you download. Now, similar to a lookup table, we have reverse lookup tables. And yes, I reversed the picture. Go and check. <laughs> These operate by saying, I've got a hash for the password of Apple. Who on this list uses that hash? Oh, a couple accounts. There's Alice, Bob, Charles. What about for blueberries? Again, we're going to get responses back. We're doing a reverse lookup against user accounts. And you can see here that no one's using the funky password, which is actually a pretty good password. They could just get it longer. Okay, so I love technology. Don't get me wrong. But, man, sometimes I look at things and I go, oh, crap. What's this going to do to me security-wise? Let me show you something. This is a computer system with multiple video cards. This was actually done as a project. Now, some of the newer video cards have GPUs on them a graphics processing unit, and GPUs love cracking passwords. So we typically think of a CPU as having multiple cores, like an i7 has eight cores, or maybe you've got a dual core. Well, GPUs have hundreds of cores in them. This particular research project, they went through and set up five of these systems. They had 25 AMD GPUs, and between the five systems, they were connected at 10 gigabit. Guess what? We don't have to do rainbow tables anymore. 
with this system, brute force, this cluster went through 348 billion NTLM passwords per second. What this means is that a 14-character password took only six minutes to hack. Yeah, but deal. What about MD5? Okay, yeah, I'll do 180 billion per second with this rig. And even if you think you're being real secure and you're using SHA-1, you only slow me down to 63 billion passwords per second being brute forced. So, yeah, video cards. Now, remember, a system like this, I would definitely use in an offline attack. I'll get your database, and probably within a day or two, I'm going to have several login options for you. Okay, so in this demo, we're going to go through, and I'm going to show you a couple tools. One of them is called Cane Enable. And the reason why it's called Cane Enable is because there's a good side to it and a bad side to it. No killing here, though. And this won't be the first time that we see Cane Enable throughout all the different domains of ethical hacking. We'll also take a look at something called John the Ripper, as well as a couple of small utilities that we can use to grab the SAM database off of a local machine and decrypt it, even if it's been encrypted with syskey. Okay, go ahead. You may release the evil laugh or simply put your pinky to the side of your mouth and <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to take you through a couple of different things here. First of all, I've launched my Windows 7 box. And we talked about how we can't do anything with the SAM database on the local machine when the operating system is up and running. So one of the tricks that you can do is obviously boot off of a different OS live CD is what they call them. Uh, for example, maybe, oh, let's see, do we have one? Maybe a Kali CD. <laughs> and you can browse and find the SAM file and take it offline. But there's another way that you can do this. I'm going to show you to you right now. This is live. So I'm on a live Windows 7 box. And if I open up my file explorer, you'll notice here that under the Windows directory, inside of, where did we say it was? Anybody remember? System32. And in a subdirectory called config. It tells me I have to have permission to get in there. Once again there, there's the SAM database. Well, the two things I want is the SAM database and the system file. Now, if I try to copy those, and let's come out here to the C drive. Let's create a new folder, and we're just going to call it SAM. We'll come in there and select to paste it. It tells me it can't because it's being used right now. So I'm just going to cancel this. Now, I told you earlier in the presentation that the SAM database and technically the system file get mounted as a registry entry. So let me show that to you. I'm going to come in here and just do a standard reg edit. And if I come in here to H key local machine, there is a component called SAM. And inside of SAM is another level here called SAM. And there's really not much to see here. But what I can do is this. Since it's a registry entry, let me open up a command prompt, and I'm going to make sure I elevate this. So I'm running as an administrator. And I'm going to just type in a simple command here. Uh, actually, let's do this. Let me back up here. And we'll do a reg save H key local machine whack SAM. I'd like to save it, please, to the C. And I called it, what, the SAM folder? And we're going to create a file there called SAM. Let's do the same thing with the system. These are the two files that you need, typically. And it's because with the later operating systems, syskey is a command utility that they included in previous OSs uh, that you could go through and encrypt the SAM database or the SAM file. And in the newer operating systems, it's turned on by default. So you need both these files. So I'm going to type in here system. I'm going to also pop that out to SAM. There we go. Let's exit out of here. And now you'll notice that in my SAM directory, I have both the SAM file, and now it's going to be encrypted here, but if I open it up, yeah, a bunch of garbly goop. But I bet... Oh, there's Bruce Wayne, his info. But again, it's kind of encrypted where I really can't see the hash. Well... That's where a nifty program comes into play that's called Cane Enable. Now, Cane Enable, first of all, you need to put up your right hand to the square, and you need to swear the Superdale Oath that with great power comes great responsibility. 
this is a tool that if you're an IT guy, we always talk about inventorying your machines, making sure you understand what software is installed. This is a major red flag if you see somebody with this product installed because it has a ton. Ooh, I missed it. It has a plethora of tools that are available to you. Uh, and we'll use this quite a bit. I'm going to come to the Cracker tab, and you'll notice, look at all the different passwords that this thing can actually help find. Yeah, start to get a little afraid, folks. I'm going to come up here and select the, the LM and NTLM hashes. And then I'm going to come up here and select the Add to List. And notice I could go through and import in hashes from a text file, or I could say get it from a SAM file. Now, the cool thing is that I can import live, so I don't have to dismount the database or make a copy of it. But again, this requires me to have physical access, but you'll get the concept here. I'm going to hit Next, and you'll notice that it immediately went through and was very, very easily able to find all the user accounts. Notice this is the LM password is empty. Here's the LM hash. Hey, remember me telling you about a particular hash? Now, that tells me right there that, yes, it is, in fact, empty. If I just saw the hash table or the hash entry and not the actual password, it would tell me that um, it was empty without even having to try to decrypt it. Normally, when you look at the SAM database, with a, there's another program out there. It's called uh, PW Dump, um, and it just shows you the hash values. It doesn't show you the passwords. If these had passwords, these would be blank, very similar to these NT passwords, and as you crack them, they would appear here. But... We're not going to be doing LM hash. I'm going to scroll over here a bit more, and you'll notice here that here are the different hashes for my different accounts. Let me do this here. I'm going to go ahead and squeeze that way down so I can make room. Uh, we don't need to see this one right now. Okay, there we go. So let's take Mr. Hal Jordan. We can take Hal Jordan, right click, and look, we can do a dictionary attack. If I have a dictionary installed, and you may be saying, Dale, how do I find a dictionary? Well, if you just simply do a Google search, I'm sure that you'll find a list of words somewhere. Outpost9.com is one that I'm very familiar with. Uh, just because I've been here before, you notice that they got several different lists. They don't have a, a, a abundant list, but you'll notice here, for example, they've got one here, yes, Names from Oz, list of movie character names, mail names, language lists. Uh, they've got a really big dictionary here. It's about three megs. And I'll include a couple of these in the files section of the course. But you could very easily grab a list and inject that way. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just do a brute force attack. So I'm going to right click, select a brute force, and I'm going to do a NTLM hash because that's what I have. He goes through and says, okay, what character set do you want to utilize? Now, I'm going to make this somewhat easier on myself for demo's sake. Notice the password length. I know that I'm not 16 characters in my passwords that I've done here. I'm just going to shrink this down a bit. Uh, and you can come in here and select different character sets to try. I'm just going to take the default here, and let's hit Start. And you'll notice here it's already found it. it tells me that the password is green. And sure enough, Hal Jordan's password would be green because he's the Green Lantern, Dale. That's right. Let's do the same thing with Dick Grayson. Again, we can do a brute force attack. Again, I'm going to narrow this down. And there's Robin. So again, if I can get a hold of the SAM database, I could definitely add that in. And again, have all the time in the world to hack your passwords. Now, here's what's kind of interesting is, in some cases, if you can just see the hash, you don't necessarily need a tool like can enable, which this is kind of sad, actually. So I'm going to make a copy of the, in, the NT hash, and I'm going to open up a nifty little website. This website will allow me to either put in a password, such as, you know, Batman, and look at the hashes, in fact, I was to go back, and we know that uh, Hal Jordan's password was green. You'll notice here that it's the same password. Just I was able to discover it using a web interface. There's also a website out there that will help you with 
LM hash cracking. All you have to do is copy and paste it in here. In fact, here, let's do this. Let's come back and grab the LM hash. I'm going to copy that. We'll bring our page back up. Now let's try popping that in there. And sure enough, it found the password being green. Okay, Dale, we're getting a little scared. Well, let's take this one step further. I'm going to go ahead and exit out of this program. I'm going to go ahead and shut down the virtual machine. And let's go in and change it and mount up our, if you remember, Kali. We installed it back in Understanding Ethical Hacking. But if you remember, it also would boot live, like a live CD. I don't have to install an OS. So let's do that. I'm going to mount the Kali ISO to my virtual machine. And now let's boot that bad boy up. We'll get biggie size here in just a second. Actually, I can probably go ahead and switch here. And I'm going to select to go live. Okay, so now Kali is up and running on this Windows 7 box, even though I haven't installed it. Well, the first thing that we can do here, I'm going to double check here, is I'm going to go up to my applications, go into Kali, and I'm going to scroll down here to my, uh, actually I know it's in the top 10. It's called John, which is short for John the Ripper. And because this is a live CD, it did not save or doesn't know about my preferences. So I'm going to change this so you guys can see this a little bit better. We'll make the font a little bolder, a little bigger. And background, we'll have solid and colors. I'm feeling a little Batman-ish today, like I don't feel it any other day. And there we go. Okay, so when you launch... John, just like all the other tools in Kali, it always starts you off with a help. And you can go back and look at the different syntaxes that you can use. A couple of things to note here is that you can use John the Ripper with a word list. If you do a word list, you specify the file, so you could utilize your word list that you've downloaded. I'll scroll down here a bit more. You could also do it based off of, in case they've been salting, so I can load the salts. And I'm going to scroll down a bit more here. There's also a format name. Look at the formats. KeyPass. Kerberos 5. Lotus 5. PDF documents. We could do a whole course just on John the Ripper. I'm going to go ahead and clear out this screen. And we'll go ahead and make this take up the whole screen here if we can. Okay, so we'll go full screen here for Kali. Again, we're just going to clear this out. And keep getting an error up here that we're disconnected from the network, but duh, I'm on the virtual machine. First of all, I want to make sure that the Windows hard drive is actually mounted up here. And I can use a simple F disk with a dash L for a list. The F disk command allows you to see the partition table for... You can see here under SDA2, the bottom entry, that that's the larger of the two drives. That first partition is actually the recovery partition for Windows. That's why it's so small. Now, I'll also want to come in here, and I'm going to do a DF, which is uh, a command that reports back the file system disk space usage. And if I do it with a K, so this shows me that the hard drive for that represents Windows is currently not mounted up as any type of directory structure. Therefore, it's not accessible to me. Now, if you remember, up at the top, the location, which was, again, dev slash SDA2. You need to remember that because we're going to mount that location up. Again, that's the drive. It's just not mounted. So let's do a mount T in TFS, and the location is dev slash SDA2. And then I do a mount option. Now if we do a DFK, You'll notice that at the very bottom, it says that it's been mounted, and it's currently mounted as mount. So let's clear this out. And so I should be able to just type in mount. So if I do an ls, there's my hard drive for Windows. So let's go into that directory where the SAM database is. So that's inside of Windows, System32, Config. If I do an ls, 
Hey, there's my SAM database. By the way, this is mentioned to you at the beginning of this demo. How can you get the SAM database off? I can just simply copy it from here to another drive. In fact, I believe I could script that out, throw that on a thumb drive, plug it into a machine, reboot the machine, let it run for a couple of seconds, and I'd have the SAM database, pull a thumb drive out, reboot the machine, Windows comes back up, the user would never know. It would actually take me probably about two or three minutes to accomplish that task. So now, because of the fact that the database is encrypted, I'm going to have to use another tool that's called BK Hive. That's, uh, let me clear this out so we can keep focused at the top. It's called BK Hive. So what it's going to do is it's going to actually dump the syskey boot key on these newer operating systems because I need that key to decrypt the SAM database. So I'm going to do a BK Hive system because that's the file that's inside of this. Let me back up again one more time here. We'll do a quick LS. Notice there's the system directory. Excuse me, it's not a directory, it's a file. I'm after the system file and I'm after the SAM file. So let's clear this out again. I'm going to do a, a BK Hive system and I want to dump it to the root folder under a directory called hive.txt. There we go. And there's that boot key. In fact, just using the boot key, do you remember back with Kane Enable when I said I'd like to use a SAM file and it said, what's the file? And underneath it, it had an entry for the boot key. Well, if I have a boot key, I can do this also through Kane Enable. But that's not where I'm at right now. So the next thing I need to do is I now need to dump the SAM file to a text file. Because remember we looked at it, it was all garbly goop. Well, we're going to use a program called SAM Dump 2. And it's the SAM file. And I want to use the key that's located inside of root, what we call it just a second ago. It was called hive.txt. And then I'm going to use a greater than sign, meaning I want to dump that then to root, and we'll call it hash.txt. Well, let's go take a look at that file. I'm going to go cd root, get back to my root directory. Let's clear this out. And let's just do a simple cat, which is short for concatenate, or in the old DOS world, we called it type. And I'm going to say, let me look at hash.txt. There's my user accounts with their hashes fully exposed to me. And remember we talked about the 500? That's their SID. That's the ending SID. Here's the ending SID for Bruce Wayne. So if somebody's changed the administrative account's name to, for example, Thor, even though I told you never to do that, I'd be able to detect which one was the administrative account because of the 500. So now let's actually crack some passwords. What do you say? Again, John the Ripper is an amazing tool. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to type in John, followed by the name of the hashed text file, which is root slash hash dot text. The format, remember our form, different formats that we could use this against, is equal to, it's called NT2, and I'd like to dump a specific user. I'd like to see the user, the password for the user, B. Wayne. Now, you can do another option here, which they just mentioned here, the double dash show. So I can do a dash dash show. Because by default, it dumps it to a directory, which is the current user's home directory in a file called John. But if I do a show, it tells me here that one password was cracked. Let's take a look at it. So I can do a concatenate john.pot. This is where it stores the password files. Oh, I forgot to go into, I need to go into the cd root slash dot john. That's the directory that makes for us, except for I've got to put the right slashes and dashes in the right place, huh? There we go. Now, if I do an ls, there's the file in there. There's a log also in there, but I can just simply concatenate john dot pot. And it tells me that Bruce Wayne's account's password, his password is Batman. Now, these are relatively short passwords, and we did this on purpose, guys, so that we could see this relatively quickly. If people are using long passwords, again, i got plenty of time. John the Ripper is extremely, or it can be extremely resource-intensive, especially if you're going after several. I like going after a specific account. So, for example, let's go back here and let's rerun that, because I would actually want to go after the administrator's account. 
Well, <laughs> which I can't do because look, what does that first part of the hash tell you? Remember, ends in triple E. Remember, and if it's repeated, it means that the password is blank. But hopefully you get the idea. So I know you've been thinking all throughout this course that you wanted to rub your hands together and laugh, which you can now officially at this time, but doesn't it make you wonder a bit, make you a little bit more paranoid, knowing how easy this is to do? Oh, Dale, what do we do now? Well, that's a great question. So do you remember how we made it in thus far? We found a user account. We cracked their password. Our goal now is to give ourselves the adequate, and I'm going to phrase it that way, adequate rights and permissions to do what it is we wish to accomplish. So don't ever make assumptions in the aspect of just because you're not an administrator or you don't have administrative rights doesn't mean you can't accomplish your goal. So once we make it in, our next step is to kind of look around. If we make it as a local administrator, I'm going to go through and take a look at any configuration mistakes that have been made. I might also check out any design errors from the network infrastructure level. Again, there are many times, if you go back and think about what we talked about with reconnaissance, that you might find a target through a Google hack, and you make your way in just using default username and passwords, and you get in, you're like, okay, well, I haven't fully reconned this environment yet. So we may want to go through and take a look, again, at these design errors. Maybe they've misconfigured or didn't change default passwords or default settings. I also want to get a layout this particular target that I've hit, what is its purpose on the network? I'm also going to be taking a look at any programming flaws. I know programmers don't make mistakes, right? They just come out with patches to enhance the application. That's kind of like us IT guys. We don't make mistakes. We just improve the performance. Now, as far as our overall goals here is we've got four basic methods for escalation. Obviously, one of the goals that we're going to have is being able to pwn the admin or the root account. But again, that may not be my whole goal. So the second method is to take advantage of a vulnerability that may be in the application or in the OS that's going to allow you access as a privileged user. There are many applications that raise the privilege of the currently logged in user on the back end that you may not even consider. Now, if you're doing your research, like I've told you to do always in the past, you may want to keep up with certain websites. This is a great one here, exploit-db.com, that tells you, or at least gives you insight about vulnerabilities that you could take advantage of. Some of these will actually go through, and you'll see here, for example, here's one right here, OS X install framework. We can actually do a privilege escalation with this particular one. Now, when I mentioned assumptions earlier, this is the one thing you have to be careful about, is that there's always the assumption that everybody's system is up to date and that you don't have to worry about vulnerabilities. Well, to be honest with you, that's not true in the real world. I talk to IT guys all the time when I'm teaching classes, and we always talk about when do they do updates. And many of them are like, oh, we don't do Windows updates until we've thoroughly tested it. Well, if that's two weeks down the road or it takes you a week to deploy the update, then there's definitely some vulnerabilities available to us. Another method of escalation is just firing up a tool. Yeah, there's got to be a joke there, right? We'll have a whole course coming up just on one particular tool that's extremely popular. That's called Metasploit. It is a complete framework and hacking suite that is designed to allow you to see if you have any exploits or any type of vulnerabilities in your network. But obviously, again, we know that attackers are going to use these type of tools against us. The downside to Metasploit is that it's extremely easy to use. In fact, it's so easy, I'm sure you might find a YouTube video about it, which means it's some 12-year-olds out there coming at my system. There's some other tools out there. There's Canvas. There's also Core Impact. Core Impact is a complete pen testing tool, as well as another one that's called Armitage, which is basically a GUI front end for Metasploit. Very, very easy for a user or, I'll say it, a tool <laughs> to fire up against your environment. And there's another method of escalation, and that is, what if we just get somebody to do it for us? Oh, Dale, why would anybody ever do that? Well, it's called social engineering, folks, and we've got a whole course coming up on that one. But I can persuade people to run an application for me or maybe to look at a file for me. I've got to entice them somehow using one of the core emotions of social engineering. Typically, I'm going to do it either out of fear or greed 
or I need some help. That's actually a, a very reliable social engineering aspect is because as humans, we like to help, right? But all I can do is send you an email, attach a script to it or a program, ask you to double click on it because it's going to, I don't know, patch your system for you and make it look like the email came from the IT staff. I could create a PDF file that when they open it up, it actually executes a program for me. I think most of us today are very leery about opening any emails coming from anybody that we're not familiar with, right? Oh, sure, Dale. Okay, I'm sending you all an email right now. Feel free to double click on the executable I'm about to send you. Okay, now there are actually different types of escalation that you can perform. And determining, again, which one you use really does or is determined by what it is you're trying to accomplish. So first we have what they refer to as vertical escalation. In vertical escalation, a user has administrative access to the computer when they shouldn't. We're moving up, right? This type of access allows the users to go through and do things like create user accounts, configure system settings, extract data that they wouldn't normally have access to. Now, this can be a potentially serious security flaw on the network where a user who ends up getting administrative privileges through escalation has access to data throughout the network. Now, one of the ways that we can accomplish this, and it's one that's typically overlooked quite a bit, it's offline access. And trust me, this is going to kill you guys. Now, when I talk about offline access, I'm talking about typically looking at machines that may not be hooked up to the network at all times. Because if a laptop gets stolen, or if I'm able to compromise that laptop, I'm going to have all the time in the world because it's offline. And because of that, I can actually just use some simple exploits to give myself total control of this machine, which then hopefully when you hook it back in, I'll be able to continue my total domination. Okay, let me show you how easy and scary this is. Okay, so I'm going to get into my Windows 8.1 machine here. And I'm going to keep this windowed because I need to be able to mount up a, a CD. So it's just on my desktop here. I'm not going into full screen uh, for a specific reason because you need to be able to see this. But we'll pretend like this is a full machine here running. And, of course, it could be a virtual machine as well. It doesn't matter. You'll notice here that I've got a command prompt open. And I'm just going to do a simple, you know, who am I? And you can see currently that I am just Bruce Wayne. And if we were to really drill into this box... Let's right click on the start button and let's go here to computer management. And if I drill in here into local users and groups and under my users, if I look at Bruce Wayne by double clicking on him and seeing who he's a member of, Bruce Wayne is a member of the administrators group, but we'll see here that Dick Grayson is not. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so let's say that, matter of fact, let's go ahead and exit this out. And let's uh, go ahead and re-sign in as Dick Grayson. Okay, so now I'm logged in as Dick Grayson. And if I come in here and look at a command prompt, and I do, a again, a, a who am I, you'll see that I'm Dick Grayson. And we know that Dick Grayson is not a member of the local admins account. Well, let's see if we can fix that. Or let's say that I am Dick Grayson and I'd like to fix this. Well, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to come up here into my actions, and I'm going to pretend like I have a DVD here. Actually, it's not under actions. It's under my media, and I'm going to insert in a disk. Now, my ISO or my DVD for Windows 8 is on this drive here, which is my U drive, and I'm going to go ahead. Oh, no, I'm not going to let you see my directory structure. So I'm going to pause the video for a second, and you'll see here that I've got yeah, see, so you're not going to see my whole structure. Uh, here's my Windows 8.1 ISO that I used for installation. I'm going to go ahead and hit Open. So now that's been mounted as my CD or as my DVD. So let's do something really fun. I'm going to make sure, again, I'm going to do this in my settings, and I'm going to make sure that when I boot, that I'm booting from CD first, and that's great because that would be what I'd want to do is I'm going to, in the real world, if this was a physical machine, I would take either a, a bootable USB drive or, and what I'm about to do, I could script out very, very quickly and very, very easy. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do a reboot of this box. So it goes into the CD. Now, when it does a restart, I'm going to click in here and then hit my space bar because it says to press any key to boot from CD or DVD. And don't be afraid 
for a second you'll lose control of your mouse or it'll be limited just to that box. And so this is the standard boot up sequence for installing Windows 8. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hit next and I'm going to select I'd like to repair my computer. Now this particular escalation will work if I'm not using some type of encryption. That's why encrypting hard drives is so important. I'm going to come into troubleshooting, come into advanced options and select give me a command prompt please. And we're going to come in here and make the properties big or make it so that you guys can actually read this. Make our font biggie size. And again, you know me and my Batman fetish. Got to have a little yellow in here. Okay, so I've got a command prompt. Now, all I have to do is type in regedit. Pulls up the registry editor. But this is the currently loaded registry. It's not really the registry of the computer. So I can make sure I have highlighted my H key local machine and come up here and select to load a hive. And the hive I'd like to load is going to be located, in this case here, it'll be on my D drive because the CD that I booted from is technically now my reserve drive or that 300 megs that Microsoft always gives us. And so I'm gonna go into the D drive, which becomes the C drive when you boot up normally. I'm gonna select Windows, come down here into System 32, whoops. And then I'm going to come down to config. Hey, Dale, we, we talked about this earlier. Yeah. And in here is where the registry is stored. So I could say, please load up the system hive for me. And it says, well, we need a name for it. And you just call it, you know, whatever. And here's my whatever hive. And you can see that I can come into my current control set of this machine. I can come in and look at services. I can modify the services if I need to. But my goal here is to escalate. I mean, this is just another way for me to mess around with the machine. Let's do the same thing, though. But in this case here, let's bring in a different hive. I'm going to select again to bring in or load a hive. And this time, I'm going to select software. Hmm, I wonder what I could do with software. We're going to, again, give this hive a name. And we're just going to call it, I don't know, Superdale. There's the Superdale software hive. And when I expand it out, I can come into Microsoft, come down to Windows. I just hit the W key and it takes me down to the W's. But I'm going to come down to Windows NT. Let's make this biggie size or expand this all the way out. Come down to current version. I'm then going to come down here to the image file execution options. Now, folks, this is actually the internal operating system debugger location. So I'm going to create a new entry to basically trick the system into doing something that I want it to do. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and create a new key. And that key, I'm going to call it util.man.exe. And you may be thinking, what's that, Dale? Why are you creating a key called that? Well, let me show you. I'm going to actually launch it on my local machine here, and I'll bring it up so you can see it. So it's the ease of access center and you just heard it read always scan this section but this is where we have access to things like the narrator contrast uh, magnifier and what I'm doing is I'm saying instead of launching this or if there's a problem I'd like to debug it in order to debug it I'm going to select uh, to not create a key Dale come on you dork I'm gonna get rid of that and we're going to come over here on util man and create a new string. And it is just simply debugger. And then I'm going to specify what that string is or its value, which is going to be cmd.exe. We'll hit OK. OK, so now we'll go through and we'll go ahead and close down regedit. And we'll go ahead and exit. And we're going to go ahead and continue into Windows 8, please. This time we're not going to hit a key. I'm going to go to log in, but instead of actually logging in as Dick Grayson, I'm going to come down and this actually activates the ease of access or utilmon. And if I click on it, I get a command prompt. I don't get the sticky keys because I'm telling it I'd like to debug it. So let's make this biggie size now. And again, we're going to change it. Whoa, don't want to do that. I want black background with some yellow Batman colors. And Look up here in the title bar. Who am I logged in as? In fact, if I do a who am I, I am actually have higher privileges than what I'm supposed to have at this point. Now hang on, we're not done yet. OK, 
Okay, well, with this nifty little command prompt, let's see what we can do. First thing I'm going to do is let's see who's a local admin. I can do that by just using a standard net local group and administrators. Oops, I spelt that wrong. And you'll notice here it shows me that both administrator and Bruce Wayne are admins. Now let's clear this real fast. And let's see what other damage we can do. Again, remember, I'm Dick Grayson. And I now know that there's a Bruce Wayne's account is in here as an administrator. And I could go through and change Bruce Wayne's password if I wanted to by doing a net user B Wayne followed by the new password. But then Bruce Wayne's going to be up to what I'm doing. So instead, let's do something a little different. Let's do a net local group administrators and let's take my account and let's just simply add it to that group now let's go look and see who's a member of the local admin group and you'll notice now Dick Grayson is now a member so now I should be able to exit this log in as Dick Grayson and now I have full rights to this box now there's another type of escalation that we can use which is called horizontal escalation and this is just simply where we use a different account with the same rights that we have to do what we want to do but we get to lay the blame on them and technically I guess there's one more escalation type it's called a de-escalation which I think you can guess by its name we're gonna take rights away from a user Uh, Dale, how do we stop this? Well, as I've told you guys before, there are some countermeasures, but you got to remember, again, your job is not to stop them, because you can't do that. You can only slow them down. Well, how do we do that? The first way is by going through and using encryption. This helps you to protect data that is considered sensitive. If I've encrypted data to a particular user, then regardless of what that user's or what my user permissions will be, I won't have access to that information. You also could take a look at least privilege when it comes to your users and applications. And what we mean by this is don't over allocate your privileges. If somebody needs the ability to do something on a machine, yeah, sure, I get it. It may be easy to just make them an admin and call it a day. But instead, take the time to figure out what rights and permissions they need and only give them those rights and permissions. You could also take a look at making sure that your updates are done. It drives me absolutely bonkers because a lot of the privilege escalation issues can be avoided by making sure that you are patching your systems. Another thing you can do is limit the interactive login. Interactive login is the right to actually throw a three-finger salute or the control delete keys on a box and log in. By default, regular users don't have the right to log in interactively on a server. You could also make sure that your service accounts are limited. Using that same concept we just talked about, that least privileges, same concept with service accounts. I see this mistake done all the time, where IT guys will go to install an application, a server application like SQL or SharePoint, and they need a service account. This is an account that utilizes the machine. As far as the machine is concerned, it just thinks a user is doing all the work, but it's being done by this account. Well, a lot of guys will just go through and use the administrator account on the local box. Again, you need to evaluate what access these service accounts need because it could create a vulnerability or a hole for you. And another one we can do is limit the extent of the code if you're the developer and you're creating your application that runs at a high privilege level. Again, typically it's when we take shortcuts that we create issues. Some other things we can do, privilege separation. Now, with this type of an approach, we limit the scope of programming errors and possible bugs. You can also test the OS and your apps meticulously. Review code if you're a developer. IT guys, if a developer says, here's a new app we're going to be using, there should be some type of documentation that says what was done where. You should question any type of code that somebody wants you to place in your environment. And you developers, don't go off and download somebody's sample code and just copy and paste it. Make sure you understand what each line does. You can also look at using multi-factor. Multi-factor, good. This way here, we place another layer of a safety net for us. And finally, do some stress tests. 
The reason behind this is because many times when an application or an OS gets overloaded, it creates vulnerabilities. You may even want to consider performing debugging using bounds checkers. Again, please realize none of these items are going to stop everything from happening, but at least it'll make you feel like you've got a handle on things. So what are our goals here in executing an application? Well, there's three of them. Overall, our whole process in this phase is being able to make sure that we can always get back in. Again, you don't go through all the steps that we've gone through just to say, ha ha, I did it, and walk away, right? At least from the attacker's perspective. We're also here to go through and see what's going on. Give us a clear picture of this system or this target machine, as well as detecting what other information could be available to us that maybe was blocking us before. Again, I think I mentioned this in a previous module. Let's say that I'm an attacker that's created a piece of software that I put out in the wild that phones home, and all of a sudden one day I see that three systems have installed my piece of software. Well, again, I'm going to use that software to get back in and then use some additional software to make sure I have an extremely clear understanding of the environment. One of the things I'm going to be looking for is, do they have any type of intrusion detection system? Now, how do we execute applications? Well, this is typically applied one of the following ways. One of the most common and easiest way is via spyware. Now, I know that's a hot word out in the industry, and there's different levels of spyware. For example, there's legitimate spyware products out there. If I was to go and install an application on my Android device, many times I'm saying, yeah, go ahead and look at my contacts or use my network connection. So my father once taught me something very, very valuable. And he said, Dale, there is no free lunch. And some of us that are old enough to understand that phrase know what he meant by that. And that is, there's nothing for free out there, folks. I know it says it's free. Gmail, hey, it's free, Dale. No, you're paying a price for that. That price is Google is going through it and looking at your emails and looking for specific words so that they can. And what Google really is in the business for is to sell marketing. That's how they make their money. Nobody's out there going, I'd like to be a good Samaritan, spend countless hours creating an application and just give it away for free. It doesn't work that way. We can also execute applications via back doors. And we'll talk about both of these technologies here coming up. We're just getting an overview of how we could execute the applications. But a backdoor allows a user or an attacker to come back in, typically without being noticed. With a keylogger, I can go through and say anytime a specific keystroke or combination of keystrokes are executed, please execute my program. We can also execute via crackers. Now, again, I'm going to get on a little bandwagon here, and I personally learned this lesson years ago myself. Matter of fact, I'll say it was when I took the ethical hacking course back when I was a wee little boy. And the concept here is when we talk about crackers, I'm talking about programs that have been cracked. Most of the programs that we get out in the wild via torrents, there I said the T word, didn't I? or via pirated software have been cracked by sophisticated people. I mean, think about it. If you can figure out how to crack an application so that it operates like the full product, I bet you could figure out a way to install an additional application so that when somebody runs the pirated version of, oh, let's say an antivirus product, that one always cracks me up, folks. Little side note here, or you can call it my ADD moment. I don't know how many times I get this message. Hey, Dale, it's your neighbor. Can you come over and help me? My machine's running kind of weird. I'm getting some strange pop-ups. And I go over there, and I'm looking at Billy Bob's machine, and I said, uh, Billy, how did you get a copy of the corporate edition of, I don't know, Semantics Antivirus? And he's like, uh, I got it off a torrent site. Yeah, that's smart. Let's download via torrent a product that's supposed to protect us. Trust me, folks, if you're running pirated software or cracked software on your machine, in the long run, you're going to spend more money repairing that system and recovering from data loss or personal identity theft than you ever would paying for that software. And again, I'm speaking from past experiences. Back in the day, uh-oh, if you're from the FBI and listening to this course, please mute your speakers now. <laughs> Back in my younger days, uh, I had a friend. Yeah. 
and he was big into pirated software. And it was really funny because his system would become unstable after a while. Huh, wonder why. So in the words of MC Hammer, be too legit, too legit to quit. And if you're not familiar with that phrase, just YouTube that bad boy. Hello, the name is Bond, James Bond. Yeah, I know, that was really bad Sean Connery, huh? Uh, spyware and backdoors. Now, typically we talk about spyware and we have this vision that comes up in our minds about stupid users or, excuse me, uneducated users who install things like grandma, or my, in my case, nieces and nephews, who install products without their knowledge that another piece of software is being installed. Spyware, again, is typically installed by us. When you download a free product, typically the manufacturer wants to know how you're running that product or maybe they are going to make money in fact, I think it's kind of funny. Last time that I installed Java during the installation, if I hadn't hit the advanced button, I would have also installed some additional toolbars and software that I'm sure that Oracle gets paid for. Last time I checked, I didn't think Oracle was hurting for money. Huh. And when it comes to spyware, technically, even your operating system is going to be monitoring things like your keystrokes. A real-world example of legitimate spyware would be Microsoft. You, we've all seen the little pop-up that says, hey, would you like to report this to Microsoft? And typically, the information that's transmitted to Microsoft or to the vendor is strictly about that particular application. But again, you got to remember, attackers are using the same technology to provide them with possibly screenshots. Maybe we'll even capture our authentication credentials as you type them in. We might even capture emails or fire up and record information when we type in something on a web form. And again, I'll use Google as an example since they're the big boy on the block and they give, quote, everything away for free. A lot of it is they're trying to capture habits. Well, think of that from the attacker's perspective. Could he not profile you a little bit better if he understood your habits? What kind of habits, Dale? that you wash your hands after going to the restroom. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Maybe some of the habits that we're capturing could be, hey, he uses this password when it comes to banking sites, or he uses this password when it comes to his social networking sites, or he typically is using just a variation of a specific password. Again, if I'm capturing both screenshots and keystrokes, I can start to capture habits. But even on my Android phone, I download a free game to play. They're capturing my habits. How long is he playing the game? And I mentioned this back in the Understanding Ethical Hacking course. I understand that this stuff is taking place. When I go to install an application on my tablet, my phone, my computer, do I sit down and read the EULA? That would be the user license agreement. No, I don't. But I understand the overall gist of it, and that is, one, you don't own the software, and two, we're going to collect information about you. And I accept that as a risk, but I only accept that as a risk from legitimate software companies. Now, let me ask you a question. Who's spying on us? Well, we've talked about marketing companies as well as software vendors, but yes, organized crime. I'm going to make him an offer. He can't refuse. I know we typically... Th think of organized crime and we're thinking, uh, oh, the mob, Dale. But trust me, big money is being made in hacking and organized crime. It's out there. Uh, side note here, if you're a member of organized crime, my name is Fred Johnson and I have nothing but total respect for you and your business. And I'm not going to ask you about your business, okay? Personally, I got taken by a Russian organized crime ring. We'll just say that that's a story for another time. Online attackers, hopefully I've drilled this into your brain enough here. Please do yourself a favor and make sure that all the software installed on your systems is legit. And it's not just software. You're going to see when it comes to spyware, I can execute the spyware even if you're just streaming a movie or listening to a song. And believe it or not, someone else who may be spying on you could be trusted insiders or people who work within your organization. So my wife works for a extremely large electronics department store that you could say has buys that are really the best. That was cryptic, wasn't it? 
But this particular company goes through and utilizes some nifty tools that tells them what software is installed on a machine, what hardware is in the machine, as well as gives them some usage information. They're actually using a product called System Center Configuration Manager. And a trusted insider would be just that. We're putting a piece of software on so we can monitor our resources. So what are the types of spyware? Uh, GDL, there's the spyware that you install on your desktop, and that's it. No, it's not. It's the most typical. This type of spyware is typically installed as you're installing an application. For example, let's say I go off and I download a copy of, I don't know, uh, WinZip. And during the installation, if I just hit next, 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 which they're hoping I do... I might actually install a new toolbar. And that toolbar in Internet Explorer is going to track some of my activities. Now, again, think of this from the attacker's perspective. Let's say that a new version of Photoshop comes out. I go through as an attacker and crack that product, put in my own piece of spyware so that when they install the application, my spyware gets installed. And I'm going to make sure that it's hidden so they can't see it running. Yes. I can hide it from your task manager, folks. We also have spyware that comes across via video. Now, I'm not talking about YouTube. However, I'm pretty sure that YouTube does monitor what videos you're watching on their channel. That would be legitimate, right? Because, again, you may think it's free. It's really not. But I had a nephew who brought me his computer once and said, Hey, Dale, it's running really slow and sluggish. By the way, that's one of your symptoms that you've got some spyware. And as I'm going through and looking at it, I'm like seeing all these programs that are firing up in the startup section. And as I'm talking to him, he starts to tell me about how he found this really cool website where he can stream movies that are still in the theater for free. Okay, there's that free word again. Folks, nothing is free. I don't care if you're streaming. And by the way, guess what? I'm sure Netflix is spying on you when you're watching videos from their service. But I'm not worried about that. I'm more worried about someone coming to my house. This same nephew tried to pull up the webpage to show me, and I was like, slow mo, no, uh, and quickly unplugged the network cable because I know what's out there. There's also spyware for printing. Uh, say what, Dale? Printing. Yeah, how about this? How about if I load a piece of spyware and everything you print, I get a copy of it, please? Dun, dun, dun. Think about that one for a second. What do you print? Uh, just Word documents. Okay, I'm sure you've never printed tax forms, medical records, or better yet, let's say your doctor gets a piece of spyware on his machine because your doctor's receptionist thinks that every time a pop-up comes up saying you need to install this piece of software because they're going to inappropriate or websites that just are malicious in nature, we install a piece of spyware and get a copy of every single document printed. There's also USB-based spyware. So I've got this piece of software that I show as kind of a proof of concept here. It's used quite often out there. But I always have students come up to me and say, hey, Dale, is there a way you can give me a copy of this white paper? Or can you give me a copy of these virtual machines? I'm like, yeah, just bring me up a USB drive. And they bring me up a USB drive and I plug it in. And I have a little program that as I'm copying files to their USB drive, I'm also injecting spyware on their USB drive so that when they plug it into their system, it injects all silently without their knowledge. It'll also go through and just download everything on their USB drive to my machine as well. There's also spyware that's injected in audio. There is no such thing, folks, as free MP3s. Again, let's think about both sides, both the legitimate reasons for spyware and the dark side of the force with spyware. Let's say you have an account with Spotify or with Google or Google Music. I guarantee those companies are monitoring and seeing what you're doing with their audio files, how many machines you've installed it on, how many times you've listened to it. Some of these are done with cookies, I understand that, but if you're installing any type of application or plug-in into your web browsers, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I guarantee you're getting some type of tracking software. Well, again, if I want to go through and get some spyware on your machine, I'm gonna get the latest, let's see, I'm a big Collective Soul fan, no, none of my passwords deal with Collective Soul. But maybe they've got a new album coming out. I'll go through, rip it, and make it so if somebody downloads it, because I'll post it on the torrent sites, and if anybody downloads it and starts to play the music, my spyware kicks in. 
And of course, there's also even spyware that's, this is another typical one besides the desktop one, and that is spyware that's distributed via email and obviously the internet. We've talked about malicious websites, and I've seen them. I've gone to a website. No, it's probably not happening on the big boys, you know, like Apple or Google or Microsoft, but, you know, you get a Oswald Cobblepot's driver download page. Oh, and that would be another type, by the way. I actually got a piece of spyware via driver. Uh, technically, I think it actually it was a backdoor. I'll have to think about that story again. But people get emails saying, hey, this is the IRS. We're going to start filing charges against you because your tax forms click here and you click on the link or the user clicks on the links, goes to a site or executes a script that's malicious in nature. And guys and gals, don't think for a second that this is limited to just to our PCs. This is exploding on the mobile platform. One of the things that I do when I'm going to install an application on my phone, again, I know that there's going to be something there to track what I'm doing, but I look at the permissions to see what it is they need access to. Let me tell you something. If it's a game, I don't care how cool the game is, and it wants access to my contacts, that's not going on my device. So make sure you review the permissions of applications. And most of the big vendors require that, whether you're getting it from the iTunes store or whether you're getting it from the App Store, from Google, or from Amazon. Those I would consider somewhat trusted sources. Be very careful about downloading software or applications from different repositories out there. I don't care if it's the coolest thing ever. In fact, that's part of the social engineering aspect of hacking. I'm counting on the fact that you want this so stinking bad that you're willing to justify and jump through some hoops and maybe install a piece of software that's going to help me pwn you. Deal, tell us about back doors. Okay, they're typically on the back side of the house facing the backyard. That was too predictable, wasn't it? Okay, so when it comes to back doors, we want to make sure that we understand what they are. And there's legitimate reasons for back doors. The first would be remote administration. But again, put that twist on it of what does the attacker look at it as? Yeah, a way of getting back in or taking control of the target. In fact, many backdoors give you total control. Sometimes it's control that the end user never even sees the interaction. And again, there's legit reasons for backdoors. As I mentioned before, System Center Configuration Manager is a legitimate backdoor because IT guys need to be able to manage their resources. But some of the more malicious backdoors will actually take use of some exploits. In fact, I've mentioned it before, a product called Metasploit allows you to create backdoors using an exploit. And the exploits are based again off of operating system, whether it's been patched or not, applications, whether it's been patched or not, and services, whether those have been patched or not. So again, remember that a lot of these backdoors are used for good. Sometimes they're even used as something funny or as a joke. There was a famous one that was called Netbus. That was a backdoor product. And if I could get the software installed in your machine, I could do funny things like, ha ha ha, eject your CD-ROM drive, or excuse me, coffee cup holder. That's an inside joke for those of us that have been around long enough. I could also reverse the mouse so that when you move to the left, it moved to the right. I could rotate your screen upside down. I could also watch what you're doing. Now, typically, backdoors consist of two components. One of them is going to be the client side. The other one's going to be the server side. The client is what I want to hopefully install on my targets, while the server is the box that all the clients will report into. Now, many backdoors will also have automation built into them. Some of that automation could include things like what they refer to as a connect back technique. This is where I am able to get the client somehow installed on the target because maybe they've downloaded my free copy of Photoshop. And since most firewalls block all inbound connections unless it's been initiated by an outbound connection, I have the client connect back through the firewall to the server. We also might use... For example, what they refer to as the first line backdoor, which is sending the initial malware. The primary backdoor acts as a downloader for other malware that we then get to install. Normally, when you see somebody that's been in injected or infected, 
it's not the only infection. There's going to be multiple. So if I get the first line backdoor installed, then the second line backdoor is what actually goes out and steals the information I'm looking for. Now, sometimes the problems with both backdoors and spyware is you you may be thinking, well, I'll just delete it, Dale, if I detect it, or I have antivirus installed. Well, the issue here is that many of these backdoors and spyware programs, part of their automation includes the ability to go through, some of you may have seen this before, and I'll make it so you can't update Windows. I'm going to disable your antivirus product. I'm going to infect your host file and make sure that you can't open that and lock down the system so that you can't fix it. Or at least it's going to take somebody with some computer knowledge, which typically isn't the standard user, to go through and try to repair it. Now, some of the more common backdoors are the most popular ones out there. Back Orifice was a really popular one. This is more of a history lesson here. It was done by an organization that was called Cult of the Dead Cow. And they got the name Back Orifice from the fact that Microsoft had a product line for all their server platform products. Not only just Server 2000, but like SQL, Exchange. These were all part of the Back Office product line. And so making fun of it, they called it the Back Orifice. Recently, Searcom is the manufacturer of a lot of routers. Or I should say they manufacture a lot of the parts that go in the routers. Routers that are sold by Netgear, Cisco, Linksys, Diamond. Well, there was actually a back door in these devices. And it's pretty funny because they actually came out with a patch that was supposed to fix the back door, but it really didn't fix it. All it did was hide the back door. Their particular back door worked across a particular port so that a, an attacker could open up a remote shell reset the router, or even make modifications to the configuration. And when we talk about backdoors, you know I can't go very far without talking about some government agencies. Some of these backdoors were included in hardware that was being sold to other countries. And currently, the NSA is actually working very hard to come up with backdoors for encryption technologies. In fact, in early 2015, Microsoft issued a security advisory where they admitted, you're going to like this one, that they are aware of a security feature bypass vulnerability, which was known as Freak. It made it possible for attackers to actually backdoor in and spy on secured communications. And you'll never guess who took advantage of that one. There's also consumer products. Remote Exec is probably one of the more popular ones out there. You can use this product to go through and install applications silently, meaning that the user doesn't see the application being installed, execute scripts. I could also use it to copy and modify as well as delete files. Maybe go through and do a filter and say, send me all DOCs. I could even change the admin password or turn the machine off or on at any given time. Huh. I don't see why this would be a problem in the wrong hands. Again, this product is actually designed for administrators to manage their environment. But if I can install something like this on your machine or get the client installed and have it report back to my server, I'm going to have total control of your box. Key loggers. Oh, you know there's one coming on this one. These are the primary lumberjacks. No? Not good enough? Okay. Uh, key loggers. I know that we see this all the time, and we have this preconception of what a key logger is, but I want to slow down here for a second because I want to make sure you guys understand what a key logger does. First of all, we all know that there's software out there galore. Some of the software has legitimate purpose to it. For example, maybe there are folks out there that want to monitor what their kids are doing on the computer. Well, there's that type of software that monitors and basically records keystrokes, mouse strokes, screenshots, who logged in, what time they logged in. It's amazing what some of these software programs do. But a majority of them will log, in fact, keystrokes. There's also, though, hardware-based key loggers. Yeah, does that look like a key logger to you? These things are extremely hard to detect. They will go through and monitor every keystroke and it doesn't look like it's a big, bad device, but some of them actually have small applications built into them so that either A, they keep a log file and I just have to recover this device, or B, that they will just simply email me the logs. So I want to back up here a second and... 
go back to revisit the concept that you need to know as a security expert what's installed on your machines, both software and hardware wise. If you were to look, be honest here, folks, if you were to look on the back of a machine, and if you saw one of these devices, like the bottom one here, plugged into the back of your system and the mouse was plugged into it, what would you assume? Or even this one here, oh, it's just a simple PS2 adapter. Or even this one up here, oh, that's just a simple USB to PS2 adapter. So the question is, is, is there a legitimate use for these devices? In secure environments, it may be the company's business to know what people are typing, what information they're sharing. And it doesn't stop at devices that look like these. This is actually a keyboard that has been modified. You can DIY it and they show you how to install a keylogger piece of hardware inside of the keyboard. You can also buy these brand new and deploy them out to the year end users. Or how about this? How about if I just send you a free one and it's connected to your system? So we're able to capture screenshots, record what websites you've been to. Uh, but don't worry, we can't record passwords. Yeah. No, no, we can, folks. I can even read your email because as you type it in, it's going to be recorded. I could also capture login names. Uh, but Dale, in the passwords, hang on a second. When I type in my passwords, I get an asterisk. Yeah, guess what? Because it's a keylogger, it's not logging asterisks. That's what you see visually. Okay, but Dale, those are physically connected devices. Uh, guess what? There's Wi-Fi keyloggers. But hey, you got a Bluetooth keyboard? <laughs> All the Microsoft keyboards are Bluetooth-based. Yeah, most of them are Bluetooth as far as connectivity from the keyboard to the system. Uh, this one here, this is actually, yeah, does it, what does it look like? It looks like a USB charger, Dale. Yep, built inside of it is a Bluetooth key logger. I don't have to be hooked up to your system. I can plug this in. You'll just think, matter of fact, I could use it as a charger for my phone. But in the meantime, it's picking up Bluetooth signals and detecting what people are typing on their Bluetooth keyboards. And here's where it gets kind of scary. You ready for this one? Yeah, they got acoustic keyloggers now. Uh, what do you mean by that, Dale? You notice how your voice got lower because now you're getting afraid? <laughs> There's uh, apps that are being experimented with right now. It does take a period of time because it has to learn the sound of the keystrokes. But over a period of time, it'll start to be able to predict via sound waves what keys are being typed. And if that doesn't scare you enough, how about a root kit logger? What's that, Dale? Uh, there's two that have been found in the wild already. One of them is called Jellyfish. And what this is is a keylogger that actually runs inside the GPU of the video card instead of through the processor or the CPU of the system. Yeah, I don't know very many antivirus products that are looking at what's running on the GPUs. There's also another one that's called Demon Keylogger. And the one that I got was, I told you I had to think about it, was a driver keylogger. So I went and downloaded a driver from not the manufacturer, mistake number one. I then installed it on my system. And the reason why I got it from a different source than the manufacturer is because the manufacturer stopped producing it. Well, it gets loaded every time the driver runs. Yeah, when does the driver run, folks? And to raise the hair on the back of your neck, we also have hypervisor key loggers. What? Yeah, these are key loggers that will reside in a piece of malware that is hypervised. So it runs underneath the OS system, so it remains untouched, just like a virtual machine. Okay, how many of you still want to give the evil laugh? Or are you starting to rethink things? Yeah, Dale, this isn't that much fun anymore. So let's get this scare fest off to a good start by taking a look at root kits. Root what, Dale? Root kits. Yeah, when you find a rootkit on your environment, you're going to think Mother Puss Bucket. Now, back in my day, rootkits were actually first discovered by something that Sony, of all people, tried to slip past everybody. This was back actually in 2005 that Sony started loading copy protection measures on about, it was like 22 million CDs. And what happened was, is that when you inserted the CD into a computer, the CD installed a piece of software that modified the operating system so that it would interfere if you tried to copy the CD. What was really bad is that the one, the rootkit couldn't be uninstalled, and two, it created actually some additional vulnerabilities. And one of the programs that they utilized actually installed, even if if the user denied or refused its EULA or the end user license agreement and it phoned home and reported what the user's listing habits were. 
And this is back during the height of things like Napster. Now, how this was actually discovered was that Mark Rushinovich, who is the gentleman who created the Win Internals suite, he actually saw something going on with the CDs, and he reported it. And what ended up happening is nobody really believed him, except for one small antivirus firm that was called F-Secure. Now, F-Secure looked at what he had written about and made the comments that you know the software wasn't itself directly malicious, but because of the way that its hiding techniques were utilized, that somebody with malicious intent could do the same thing. F-Secure was actually one of the first companies that came out with one of the first root kit and uninstallers. So why do we use root kits? Well, they have two primary functions associated to them, remote control or backdoor, as well as eavesdropping. Root kits allow a, an attacker to gain administrative control over a computer. This means that he can run any program, see what people are doing on the system, even change the system's configuration. Now there's also several different types of root kits out there. These different types of root kits allow for different functionality. We'll talk about those here in just a second. But the biggest issue is these are extremely hard to remove. Root kits are the mother of all infections, if you want to think of it as from a virus perspective. So, again, why are root kits used? Well, again, we're going to gain remote control access. We can watch what's going on with the environment. Yeah, but DL, uh, I just got my antivirus and it's doing just fine. It didn't detect it. Well, first of all, you need to make sure your antivirus is always, always up to date. But there is something out there referred to as the polymorphism of rootkits. Now, this technology makes rootkits extremely difficult to find because what it allows the rootkit to do is to rewrite the core assembly code. So now all of a sudden your antivirus, especially if it's signature based, is useless. The only way to actually find root kits that use polymorphism would be to use a technology that looks deep inside the operating system and compares it against a baseline of what a good operating system or a healthy operating system would be like. Now I mentioned that there are types of root kits. Yeah, there's several of them out there. The first one is referred to as a user mode root kit. In user mode, the rootkit runs on the computer with administrative rights or privileges. This allows the rootkit to alter security as well as hide processes, files, system drivers, system services, and the rootkit stays installed by just simply copying the files to the computer's hard drive and automatically launching them every time the system boots. Now, the downside, at least from the attacker's perspective, is that user mode is one of the only types that antivirus and anti-spyware applications typically can detect. Another type of rootkit is referred to as kernel mode. Now what the attackers have done at this point is that they know that the user mode rootkits can be detected. So how about if we just load the rootkit at the same level as the operating system? At this point, the operating system can't be trusted. One of the most famous kernel mode rootkits was one that was called Da iOS Rootkit, which was focused at Cisco's iOS operating system. So yes, you can get rootkits on network devices. There's also a hybrid rootkit. This is basically the best of both worlds, where we can take some of the characteristics from a user mode rootkit being that it's easy to use and stable along with the kernel mode, meaning I can really hide this thing. And this is actually one of the more popular root kits out today. And guess what? We can't forget firmware. Say what, Dale? Firmware? Yeah, this type of root kit could be similar to a user mode or a kernel mode, but this root kit actually hides in the firmware when the computer shuts down. So when you restart the computer, the root kit just reinstalls itself. Now, when we say that it hides itself inside of firmware, it could be anything from a microprocessor code to a PCI expansion card firmware. And again, on every restart, the rootkit gets re-injected. We also have, yes, virtual rootkits. Then they don't exist. Well, no, they exist. These are relatively new. And the most popular one that I can think of is one called Blue Pill, which is based off of x86 virtualization. And it was a proof of concept that was presented in Black Hat back in 2006. And yes, Red Pill gets its name from a movie reference. I'll let you figure that one out. The concept of Blue Pill was to trap a running instance of an operating system 
by just simply starting a really thin hypervisor and then virtualizing the rest of the machine underneath it. The previous operating system would still remain and any references to devices or files, but anything that dealt with hardware interrupts, uh, request for data, uh, including system time, could be intercepted or faked by the new hypervisor. Now, the gentleman who came up with this actually made the statement at Black Hat that he felt that it would be 100% undetectable because the rootkit itself was virtualized. Yeah, but Dale, I, I still have antivirus, and I keep it up to date. Yeah, I don't care. And what I mean by that is... Your antivirus might pick up the fact that you have a root kit on your machine, and you can go through and try to clean it off, but I want you to repeat after me. This is Superdale rule number 385, and that is any system that's been detected with a root kit is no longer trusted. What that means is you're going to take it offline, format the hard drive, and reinstall. Do not, this is my personal feeling, do not try to continue to use an operating system that has already been compromised because you don't know, again, if it's firmware-based, cleaning it may clean the one instance, but as soon as you restart the machine, you're back to square one. Alternate data streams, or also known as ADS, or as I like to refer to it as, oh, crap. So first of all, I need to make sure I have your attention. Next to passwords, this is my next pet peeve. When it comes to alternate data streams, there's something you need to understand. First of all, this is not a well-known feature. I'm surprised how many times I teach a security class and I mention alternate data streams to guys that have been in IT for years who are like, I didn't know that was something that could be done. Now, ADS has been around since NT, yeah, 3.1, yeah, that's a long time ago, but it's still being used today. And the reason that this feature was first created was, thanks Steve Jobs, yeah, it was so that Microsoft could be compatible with the Macintosh Hierarchy File System, or HFS. Now, the Macintosh File System actually stores its data in two parts. There's a data fork and a resource fork. The data fork is actually where we store the data itself about that file. The resource fork is what gives us additional information about a file. What do you mean by that, Dale? Well, let me show you. I'm going to jump here into my uh, Server 2012 R2 machine, and I'm going to just pull up a File Explorer here. I'm going to drill into a file, and it doesn't really matter where you go, but I'm just going to come in here. Let's go into Windows. And we'll scroll down here and just take a look at any file. It's just, I have no idea what this is. It's a text document. It's called PFRO. So the data fork, if I double click on this, is what actually it creates the data, the, what's inside the file. But if I right click on a file and select properties, I'm able to go through and look at details. This information is being stored in the resource fork. In fact, if I was to open up or, excuse me, right-click on a music file. In fact, here, let me bring one up on my host machine here real fast. So I've pulled up here, a, or I've right-clicked on a music file. Looks like it's not named correctly. Let me just change that real fast. So this is Collective Soul's song called Shine. If I go to the Details section, you'll notice because it's a music file, I have some additional options in here, such as how long the song is, its genre. Well, all this information, the album that it came from, all this information is coming from the resource fork. Because of these two forks, we're actually able to hide files extremely efficiently here, folks. So this is one of those necessary evils. We want to be able to store additional data about a document as well as the document itself. Well, uh, Dale, can you show us how that's done? Yeah, absolutely. So to start off here, I'm going to open up a command prompt here. And from the command prompt, I'm going to create a directory so that we can play around without affecting the operating system too badly. And I'm just going to simply call this one streams. Actually, let's call it ADS. I'm going to go ahead and move into ADS. And I'm going to go ahead and type in notepad, call it, a, give it a name. So the file I'm going to create here will be called superdale.txt. And then I'm going to do a colon hiding from you.txt. Now it tells me, do you want to create a file? Sure, let's go ahead and create this. And I'm going to put in here that uh, the dark night rules the city. 
guess if I'm going to do all caps, I should keep all caps. And let's go ahead and save that. And we'll go ahead and exit. And let's do a directory here real fast. You'll notice that there's a document there that's called Superdale. Notice the size. But wait, Dale, you just typed something in there. Yeah, you're right, I did. In fact, watch this. If I just do a notepad to open up superdale.txt, you'll notice it's blank. This is my normal text. I can save that and exit out. If I do a directory, you'll notice that its size is at 22 bytes. Let's clear this out. Again, if I was to open up File Explorer here and go into my... ADS folder and double click, I'm going to get this is my normal text. Well, the dark night rules the city is hidden in the separate stream. So in order to gain access to it, I would have to type in notepad followed by the name of the file, which was superdale.txt colon hiding from you.txt. And there's my hidden file. Now, starting with Windows 7 and higher, Microsoft did make this a little bit easier for us as far as detecting alternate data streams. But unless you know what you're doing, you're never going to see it. You know if I do a directory, we see the Superdale file. If I do a directory with a slash R, it actually shows me the alternate data stream. And you can see here that the hiding from you text is actually 31 bytes. The Superdale document is 22 bytes. But this is a new item or a new feature from Microsoft so that you can just quickly go through and say, please show me if there's any alternate data streams on any of these files. Okay, so let me clear the screen here and let me try to see if I can't get this to work with a program. We're gonna come up here and I'm gonna go grab a file here that we can use. Go into Windows, and let's just, under Windows, let's just grab RegEdit. Or, you know what, let's grab Write. I'm going to copy Write, and I'm going to paste it inside of my, whoops, my directory for ADS. Again, look at the size of the files. I'm going to create a new file real fast here. We'll just do another notepad, and we'll uh, create one called Batman.txt. We'll create this one, and we'll put... Yeah, Batman. We'll just save that. So I just got a standard text file sitting here with me. Let's do a directory. You can see both write and the Batman file. So let's see if I can't inject write as my evil, which like write is my evil program. In fact, let's just do a quick rename of write.exe to be called evil.exe. Let's do another directory. There we go. So we can see we got our evil exe. Let's clear this out, and let's try this. We're going to do a type, evil.exe. We're going to do a greater than sign, and then type in, put it inside of the batman.txt file, but make it as an alternate data stream for evil2.exe. Okay, now let's take it to a directory. You'll notice that the batman file is still 11 bytes. Let's just delete the evil.exe file. And so now evil doesn't... <laughs> there's a joke. Evil does not exist on my system. Uh, it actually does. So let's see what happens if I do a start batman.txt colon evil2.exe. Now we do get an error with Windows 8 and higher that in this case here there's no apps that are available to open this type of file. So what I want to do now is make use of something called a symbolic link. A symbolic link is basically like a shortcut. So I'm going to type in an MK link. I would like to create a link that's going to be called joker.exe and it actually points to, and you do have to do the full path. So ADS backslash batman.txt colon evil2.exe. And now you'll notice if I do a directory, we've got a symbolic link called Joker. So if I just run Joker, you'll notice that WordPad opened up. Now, I could, if I wanted to, go through and hide Joker as well. As far as its attributes are concerned, I could do a, a trib, uh, do a minus, excuse me, a plus h, joker.exe. Except for I have to spell it right, don't I? 
I, wow, I'm really goofing up today. A T T R I B H Joker dot E X E. There we go. So now if I do a directory, you notice I do see it from a command prompt, but if I look at it from File Explorer, ah, it didn't take. Let me go ahead and hide it. There we go. Now it's hidden. And if I do a directory here, there we go. So now it's hidden. And now I can just simply type in Joker, and boom, I get WordPad. Yeah, so uh, go ahead and torrent down the latest application. I'm sure it's completely safe. Steganography, or we sometimes refer to it as just Stega. Stega is the ability to take a document and basically hide it in plain sight. And how we do that is we just place the document inside of a, more commonly, a photo. So we can hide it behind or inside of other data. Now, unlike alternate data streams, the size of the picture file, in this case, since I'm talking about a photo, it will increase in size. If I've got a picture that's one meg in file and I've got a document that's four megs, the picture file then becomes five megs in size. And how it does this, or how it's able to hide inside of the other file, is that it replaces places the unused data bits with the bits from the file you're trying to hide. And it's extremely difficult to detect. In fact, some will say that it's almost impossible to detect. Now, steganography is actually broken into two classifications, both technical and linguistic. Technical steganography hides the message using a scientific method, where linguistic steganography hides the message inside of what they refer to as a carrier or some type of media that's used to transfer files back and forth or communicate. As far as the type of steganography that's accessible to us, well, we can hide files, yes, inside of an image. We can also use steganography to hide files inside of a, another document. Very similar to what we saw with alternate data streams. Steganography can also be used to hide files inside of a folder or the object representing the folder as well as audio. Yeah, I can hide a hidden message or a hidden file inside of an audio file. In fact, this is one of the things that's going on right now in fighting terrorism is that a lot of the terrorist organizations communicate with each other by hiding their messages inside of audio as well as possibly even video-based files. You always hear on the news that and, you know, a new video has been released by some terrorist organization and that the government is currently reviewing. Well, what they're doing, folks, here is they're going through and checking to see if there's anything hidden inside of the video as well as looking in depth at the video to find out if they can find out where it's coming from by looking at backgrounds, listening to background noises as well. We can also hide our files inside of web-based applications or websites even, so that you have to know exactly where to go within the website, either hidden image, hidden URL, or just a hidden location on the page that would reveal information that is normally not visible. We can also use it to hide information, what we refer to as a white space. We typically do this with a program that's called Snow, which conceals the message, which is normally in an ASCII format, by pinning white space to the end of each line. Now, because the space and tabs are generally not visible in text viewers, the message is effectively hidden. And if you use built-in encryption, the message can even be read, even if it's detected. We can also use steganography to hide files, obviously, in emails. In fact, it's very similar to the web-based steganography types because most emails will support HTML. And so again, we can hide files or messages inside of emails. We can also use it to go through and hide files inside of DVDs. So again, I ask you, where'd you get your last copy of the latest movie release? I could actually be hiding my tools. And when you run the movie or go to watch it, my tools inject. Another type of steganography is what they refer to as natural text-based. These type of programs will convert information that you're trying to transmit into a flow of text like a play. So if somebody's looking at your text document, they're going, what is this guy talking about? He's just talking about one day he went for a walk with his dog. But one of the more popular programs out there, it's called Sam's Big G Playmaker, goes through and you hide your text within the play itself. Another type is hidden OS based. This is where I inject my tool inside of some of your hidden operating system files and my tools execute off any time that your operating system needs to use those files.
Okay, by a show of hands, how many of you now feel like, I don't want to play anymore? So, why do we cover our tracks? Uh, do I really need to explain this one to you guys? Our goal here is, first, we want to remain obscure. Again, we don't want somebody knowing that we've gotten into the system. Otherwise, all of our hard work has gone to waste. The other reason is that we want to avoid what we refer to as tracebacks. This is where the victim hires a forensic expert to figure out exactly what happened. Back in the day when I had my own ISP service, I had a customer. You may have heard this story before, so I'll condense it down. But I had a customer who was complaining that he wasn't getting the speeds that he was paying for. And one of my sidekicks... Uh, his name is Mark Burnett, and no, not the guy who does Survivor. Uh, he's actually a white hat from Microsoft. Uh, you can Google him and find him. He's actually written several books about security and double IS. Well, he happens to be a neighbor of mine, and we saw something going on with this particular customer's antenna, so we went out there, and long story short, the customer had plugged the Internet connection directly into his company laptop without going through a router, and he totally got pwned. Uh, and what we found is that the reason why he wasn't getting the speeds is because somebody had gone through and uploaded movies on his laptop and was using his laptop as a parted FTP server. Well, what Mark was able to do was use some of the log files that we were looking at to see the IP addresses of the connections coming in. And we were able to trace it back to an IP address. Unfortunately, it was in Germany and wasn't much that we could do about it at that point, which I guess really does sum up one of our biggest problems with the Internet today. There is no sheriff in town, is there? But that's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid tracebacks. The other purpose or the other goal here is that we want to convince the victim or victims that nothing is going on. This machine has not been compromised. Continue to do what you're doing. In fact, it's when machines start acting funny that people start getting their suspicion up, right? Now, we could also talk about, obviously, the big issue for attackers not wanting to be detected is, hey, they don't want to go to jail. So let's take a moment. We'll go through and take a look at a basic method of clearing our tracks, which would be a good attacker. And then we'll take a look at what a great attacker might accomplish. So a basic method is something that we would consider or we would categorize a good attacker would accomplish or what he would do during his covering of his tracks. They're going to go through and do some of the basic things. And most of this will be detected very easily. But hey, at least they're trying to cover their tracks. One would be to go through and clear any browser history because they may have used that machine to look up information about the target, uh, the vulnerabilities that are on the target, or if they're trying to upload a file or download a file from a website, or if they've done any type of research, they're going to want to clear out the browser history. There's also the issue of internal users not wanting the IT department or security professionals to know that they are looking up things about, oh, how to crack a hash on a Windows 7 box. They might also go through and delete cookies. Now, if they're Oreo cookies, I personally delete those very quickly. <laughs> no. But what cookies are designed to do or to contain information about, in the case of a website, your preferences for that website. And I'm always amazed that I have a lot of people that will come to me and say, hey, Dale, can you help me clean up my computer? And I'll be looking around and I'll notice that their history and their browser has been cleared out, but they always forget about the cookies. It's all about the cookie. And the cookies actually contain information about sites that they visited. So this would be another entry that an attacker would want to delete. He may also want to delete any downloads that he may have done on this particular machine. Maybe as an attacker, I've downloaded a payload file that I made available on a website somewhere or an FTP site. And we'll talk about payloads in another course, but I want to delete those so they're not visible anymore. Also want to go through and clean out any password managers that may be on this machine. Again, this would be more towards the aspect of a internal user who wants to make sure that nobody sees what his passwords are, but this would also possibly apply to an attacker. They'll also want to go through and delete any private data that may be on the machine. Now, as an instructor, whenever I go to different training centers, most of them provide an instructor machine for me, and I use that machine while I'm teaching. Well, obviously, while I'm using that machine, I may check my email. I might uh, load up my Dropbox or my OneDrive, and uh, at the very last day, I actually have a script that I carry around with me now on a thumb drive that I execute off that goes through and clears out all that private data for me. 
Now, you could actually say that these would be some good guidelines to follow if you are ever in fear of somebody utilizing the same machine that you've been using. They'll also want to go through and clear out the logs. Now, there are certain files on the system that track everything that's going on on a machine, and it just records it inside of a text file. Now, this is actually considered a, a newbie move, or something maybe that a script kitty does, because they don't know any better. By clearing out the logs, you actually raise a flag. And let me show you why. So here I am on my server 2012 R2 box. And I'm going to come into an application or a console that's called Event Viewer. Now, Microsoft made some changes when it came to the Event Viewer. In it, you can see here that we have our Windows logs. We have an application log. We have a security log. The security log is probably one of the more important ones because it shows us successful and failures when it comes to logging in. We also have system logs. Now, these files are actually located on the hard drive in the C drive under Windows inside of System32 inside of a subdirectory called WinEVT and, of course, logs. In the old days, these files were saved as a specific format. And let me see if I can view the format here for you. There we go. You'll notice that they are EVTXs. This was the major change. In previous versions of the operating system, they were just a standard EVT. So you can see here, if I sort this, there's the security log. Here's the system log. And there's all kinds of log files in here. But what a noob will do, or a newbie, is he'll come in and say, I don't want them to see what I've been doing. So I'll just come in here to the security log, right-click on it, and select, and select to clear the log. Well, guess what? Clearing the log, here comes the flag. The first entry that's placed in there is the log was cleared. And who cleared it? Plus, you can see everything is empty here. As a security professional, I can see that something has happened here and that somebody cleared it out. It was cleared out by the administrator on a specific time and date. And so that's going to throw a big flag for me. Okay, so now I've switched over to one of my desktop machines. This is the Windows 8 machine, or the, excuse me, the Windows 8.1 machine. Something else that you may want to do is as you open up documents and maybe make modifications to them, you'll want to make sure you get rid of that history. There's actually a document history that's maintained by Windows. So to get rid of that, I would want to go in and type in regedit to open up my registry. I'm going to go ahead and hit yes. And I'm going to come in here to H key current user inside of software, Microsoft, then Windows, current version, and under Explorer. What I'd want to do is I'd want to delete all these entries here, except for the default entry. And this is going to go through and remove all of the recent documents that I've opened up. Now, there's some software programs that will do this for you. This is a program that's called CCleaner, where you can see you can go through and specify things like I'd like to clean up my internet files, history cookies, recently typed URLs, uh, recent documents. This goes through and just whacks everything for you automatically. Uh, some of the information like you can come into the registry, help clean it up. It's designed to clean the system up, but we can also use it. We'll analyze this. You can see I've got some searches and Microsoft search going on. So we just simply run the cleaner. And again, it'll take care of that for us. So now I've got nothing to show. CCleaner is a free product, but they do have a paid version that you can use as well. And there's several other tools out here. I'm not really here to push any particular type of tool. That's just an example. Yeah, I should get like paid for during referrals for tools, huh, guys? So the advanced methods, or what a great hacker does. To learn the advanced methods, send $9.99 to Dale Meredith at... I'm just kidding. We'll show you. So the overall concept here with the advanced method is that a great attacker is not going to just clear out the logs. What he's going to do is he's going to use some tools to help him do the following. He first wants to disable auditing so that the system is no longer looking at what he's doing. Afterwards, he then does his damage, tries to hack the password, makes modifications to files, whatever he needs to do. Then after he's done, he simply just turns the auditing back on. Now, back in the back in the old days, the log files that I showed you on the server 2012 box, let me pull that back up so we can see that again. These log files, I told you that now they're called an EVTX file. Well, back in 
Server 2000, there was a nifty little program out there that made a lot of people frustrated. It was called WinZapper. And WinZapper would allow you to go through and selectively delete entries within a log file. So I could go open up the log file and say, ah, that one I don't want anybody to see, and I could kill it. Now, it's kind of funny. Check this out, because... It was known, it tells you, that there's a small risk that this program could corrupt the log files so that they'd be completely unreadable. Well, let's see. From an attacker's perspective, if it corrupts the log file, do I really care? As far as the security expert is concerned, he would just think, oh, well, the log file got corrupted. Now, in order to turn off logging, we could just simply, since we were in the box already, we could simply open up a command prompt and use a built-in utility that's called audit poll for audit policy. And what I can do with audit poll is, first of all, if you want to see some of the syntax for it, you can see that there's a get. So you can display the current audit policy. I can set, I can list, I can back up, restore, I can clear, as well as remove a policy for a user account. But what I want to do here is, I just don't want anybody to see any successes or failures of a login. So let me clear this out again. And I'm going to do an audit poll. And I want to set, and the item I'd like to set is in a category that is called log on, log off. And I'd like to change the success, so any successful logins to be disabled, as well as any failures to be disabled. And you can see now it's been turned off. After I do my damage, I would just simply go back and use the enable switches to turn everything back on. Now another thing that you could do, let's close this down, and we know about these log files. Well, how about this? Let me close this down, and let's take a look at the security log. If I look at the security log's properties, you'll notice here that it has a default log size of about 20 megs, and the default is to overwrite the events as needed. Now, I could look at this two different ways. I could either lower this down so that the log file gets overwritten sooner. At least that's from the attacker's perspective. From the security professional's perspective, the default, remember we talked about the default location for the log path? Well, why don't we change it to someplace else? This could make it a little bit harder for the attacker to find out where the log files are located. By the way, this is also where you could clear the log. Now, there's another utility out there that we can use, and you might see us talk about it in update, upcoming courses. It's called Metasploit. And Metasploit has built into it, a f well, Metasploit itself is a framework, and in that framework, we can install something called MeterPreter. And what it has the ability to do is remotely hit a box and clear the log file. And when I say clear the log file, it doesn't even show the log file was cleared entry. It just completely wipes it out. And most IT guys would just look at it and go, oh, well, my log files looped, ran out of space that was reserved for it, and they just continue on. And there's no evidence whatsoever of who cleared out the log file. Now, you may be asking yourself, Dale, why doesn't somebody just come in and attempt to edit those EVT files? Well, there's a good reason behind that. And Microsoft, like I said, they changed things up a bit. They've made it now so that you can't do that. So again, if we come in here into our System32 directory and we scroll down, went too far, with the win event file, logs, and if I say I'd like to open this file up, I can only open it up with the event viewer snap in. You could try to open it up with a, matter of fact, before I do that, let's copy this so you can see this. I'm going to copy it and we'll just put it here on the desktop and from here if you try to open it with another product such as let's do it with WordPad it's no longer in a standard text file format uh, it's technically binary based so that's why we can't make that modification directly to the file now I'm sure just like everything else when it comes to security it'll only be a matter of time before somebody's able to crack this bad boy. Eh? Did you hear me? I use that famous word. We hear it all the time with hacking. Time.